looking into campaign fundraising. Chairman Dan Burton led the questioning of Interior Secretary Bruce Babbitt. At issue was a decision to deny a permit to build a casino near a dog racing track in Wisconsin. The hearing's five hours and 20 minutes. will come to order. Uh, you may be seated, seated right now, Mr. Secretary, if you don't mind. Good morning. A quorum being present. The Committee on Government Reform and Oversight will come to order. Today we will continue the hearing regarding the, the Department of the Interior's decision to deny an application made by three Indian tribes in Wisconsin to take land in trust for gambling purposes. This is our fourth and final day of hearings into allegations of political pressure on the Interior Department to reject an application by three poor Wisconsin tribes to open a casino in Hudson, Wisconsin. Our final witness and our only witness for today is Secretary Bruce Babbitt. Mr. Secretary, thank you for being with us today. Chairman, good morning. Several of my colleagues on the Democratic side commented yesterday that they have seen no evidence of political interference in this decision. Member after member on that side of the aisle said there was not one shred of evidence indicating that politics had been brought to bear. Unfortunately, there is evidence. There is sworn testimony. The allegations against Mr. Babbitt were not made by me. They were not made by anyone in the Republican Party. They were made by one of Secretary Babbitt's best friends. They were made by Secretary Babbitt's former law partner and campaign manager, a longtime Democrat, Mr. Paul Eckstein. Paul Eckstein went to see Secretary Babbitt the day the casino application was rejected. He asked for more time for his clients, the Wisconsin Chippewa tribes, to address whatever objections the department had. Secretary Babbitt told him that he couldn't give him more time because Harold Ickes wanted the decision out that day. Mr. Eckstein contends that Secretary Babbitt went on to ask if he knew how much these Indian tribes had given to the Democratic Party. Apparently, Mr. Eckstein didn't know, so Secretary Babbitt told him it was in the neighborhood of a half a million dollars. Secretary Babbitt has, by his own admission, lent credibility to Mr. Eckstein's story by changing his own account of that meeting so radically. At first, he denied ever invoking Harold Eckes' name or mentioning donations by Indian tribes. Then, a year later, he reversed course. He said that he did invoke Harold Ickey's name, but that, that he was lying to his old friend to get him out of his office. Do Mr. Eckstein's allegations have credibility? They apparently have enough credibility for the Justice Department to be close to seeking an independent counsel. Reuters and CNN quoted Justice Department officials on January 19th as saying that it was virtually certain that the Attorney General would seek an independent counsel in this case. And we all know that this is not an attorney general who seeks independent counsels at the drop of a hat. I have a copy of Secretary Babbitt's opening statement with me. In it, the secretary says that he never had any contact with Mr. Ickes on this issue. Two senior members of his staff who testified yesterday said that they never had any contact with Mr. Ickes. Apparently, as the secretary was attempting to get Mr. Eckstein out of his office, he pulled Mr. Ickes' name out of thin air. But why Harold Ickes? Why not Leon Panetta or George Stephanopoulos or the president? Why invoke the name of Harold Ickes? We have a few clues. Perhaps the fact that Harold Ickes' assistant called Secretary Babbitt's assistant three times about this application had something to do with it. It's also an interesting coincidence that Mr. Ickes has, was lobbied directly on this issue not once, but twice by Tom Schneider of the law firm of O'Connor and Hannon. It's even more interesting that on the day that the casino application was rejected, Mr. Schneider's law partner, Patrick O'Connor, who testified here yesterday, noted in his billing records that he needed to follow up with Harold Ickes at the White House to outline fund fundraising strategies. This is the same Harold Ickes who kept records of large contributions by Indian tribes to state parties in his office. 
Do all of these coincidences suggest an explanation as to why Secretary Babbitt might invoke Harold Eckes' name? Do they lend credibility to Mr. Eckstein's sworn testimony? I would say that they do. But don't take my word for it. Here's what Federal Judge Barbara Crabb had to say last March. Quote, there is considerable evidence that suggests that improper political pressure may have influenced agency decision making. End quote. Here's what the Justice Department attorney who is representing the Interior Department in this civil suit had to say. Quote, now that we have reviewed the administrative record in greater depth, we have determined that the alleged problems with the process are significant. We are primarily concerned about our ability to show that plaintiffs were told about and given an opportunity to remedy the problems which the department ultimately found were outcome determinative. The attorney general appointed by Bill Clinton has, according to news reports, found enough credible evidence to seek an independent counsel. Now, this remains to be seen, but this is what reports have been made on, on, on through the media. A federal judge appointed by Jimmy Carter found considerable evidence of improper political interference. The Interior Department's own lawyers said that they didn't follow their own procedures and recommended settling the case. Two of the Secretary's top aides left the Department for very lucrative jobs representing the tribes who benefited from the decision. And yet some of my colleagues here today say there is no evidence whatsoever of any wrongdoing. I find that amazing. I am tempted to discuss at length the multitude of ways that the Interior Department violated their own procedures. There was no finding of any detriment to the local community, which is required by the law. There was never any meaningful consultation with the applicants to give them a chance to resolve any problems, which is required by the law. They reopened the administrative record at the request of the opposing tribes, the very rich tribes, and they kept it a secret from the applicants, the very poor tribes. I won't go into this at length, in the, into this at the length that it deserves, but let me summarize it in this way. The poor tribes, the tribes whose members made an average of about $6,000 a year, the tribes that couldn't afford to give anything to the DNC, were completely shut out of the process. They were kept in the dark. The wealthy tribes, the tribes whose casinos were bringing in around $400,000 a year for every man, woman, and child, the tribes who went on to give $356,000 to the Democrat National Party got special treatment. That pretty much says it all. Secretary Babbitt, thank you for agreeing to testify today. I'm certain that you will defend your record very ably. We will proceed to your opening statement in a moment, but first I want to recognize Congress Waxman, Congressman Waxman for his statement. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. As we uh, uh, come to the end of our examination of the Hudson uh, Casino decision, uh, we've sat through uh, hearings. Uh, we've heard uh, this controversy described both as a fight uh, between competing Indian tribes and a prime example of selling public policy for campaign contributions. This is our fourth hearing on this matter. But the essence of this fight really came into focus for me at the end of yesterday's hearing. When I looked around the room, I only saw three other committee members present and not a single reporter. The only people here were Interior Department officials and Fred Havenick, the owner of the Hudson Dog Track and his team of lawyers. In the end, when we're finished with our speeches and questions, that's what this controversy is all about. It's about one man's determined effort to force the Interior Department to approve his proposal to build a casino in Hudson, Wisconsin. In waging this fight, Mr. Havenick has done nothing illegal or improper, but he has pulled out all the stops to get his way. When he first proposed his dog track in the 1980s, he had to surmount local zoning ordinances and fierce local opposition. He managed to do both, and he opened his track. When his track lost millions, as everyone predicted it would, he conceived the idea of bringing a Las Vegas-style casino to Hudson. But because only Indian tribes were permitted to operate casinos under Wisconsin law, he needed to find a, an Indian tribe willing to be his partner. When the combined vote of the towns of Hudson and Troy rejected the casino, his first partner, the St. Croix Indian tribe, withdrew. So Mr. Havenick had to look around for some other partners. 
And in 1994, uh, he found uh, uh, new uh, uh, partners in three other tribes that were 80 to 200 miles away from this site where his dog track was located. So he uh, petitioned the Department of Interior with these new partners for what's called an off-reservation trust. That means that the land is taken away from any control of the local jurisdiction, state and city officials and turned over to the federal government. And then under the federal government's aegis, a casino could be opened up, even though it's not on a reservation. Well, when the Interior Department uh, uh, found that local opposition was intensifying and uh, opposing uh, the uh, tribes, Mr. Havenick mounted a lobbying campaign. He hired his own lobbyists. One of them, Paul Eckstein, appeared to be the one lobbyist in Washington who would have the best access to Secretary Babbitt. Now, it's interesting, the chairman just said that what we had were poor Indian tribes, they couldn't afford contributions, they couldn't afford representation, they were shut out. In fact, Mr. Havanick and his partner, Indian tribes, who put up no money, but looked forward to realizing some economic benefit from this casino, hired lawyers, hired uh, people to uh, do what they could. Mr. Havidick had made political contributions, and they hired a lobbyist. They hired a lobbyist whose biggest claim to fame was that he was a personal friend of the secretary's, and they hoped that he would influence the secretary. Um, well, it didn't work out that way. The Department of Interior rejected Mr. Havidick's scheme, and so Mr. Havidick hired more of an army of uh, lawyers and lobbyists to overturn this decision. He filed a lawsuit in Wisconsin and deployed lobbying superstores like the powerhouse firm of Patton, Boggs and Blow to argue his case in, case in Washington. And he's doing all of this with a real sense of urgency. He's losing millions of dollars without a casino and believes he can make millions of dollars with one. As we've held these hearings, it's become clear that not a single member of this committee shares Mr. Havinick's view that it makes sense to locate a casino in Hudson, Wisconsin. I haven't heard any member on either side of the aisle, Democrat or Republican, argue with the substance of the Interior Department's decision. In fact, we learned that elected officials in Wisconsin have consistently opposed the casino, including the former Republican congressman, from the area, the state attorney general, and the governor. Democrats and Republicans alike back home didn't want this casino. So instead of challenging the decision, the chairman has argued that the decision was right, but that campaign contributions and political considerations improperly affected the political, uh, affected the decision-making process. But in our hearings and depositions, we have heard from the four Interior Department employees most involved in this issue. They have all testified under oath that they made the decision on the merits and without political interference. That's what George Skabeen, Hilda Manuel, Michael Anderson, and Tom Hartman said in their depositions, and some of them were even allowed to testify in our hearings. They've all said that this was uh, the basis of uh, their decision was based on the merits and not because of political interference. That position was affirmed yesterday by John Duffy and Tom Collier. Those are the facts, regardless of whether the chairman or Mr. Havinick want to accept them. And if I fault Mr. Havinick and others for anything, it's for their readiness to ignore the facts and impugn the motives of anyone who disagrees with them. When asked about his own significant campaign contributions, even to people who could make the decision about this casino, Mr. Havinick said he made his contributions because he was a generous man motivated by a belief in the candidates to whom he was contributing. It was not an effort, he said, to buy influence. But when Mr. Havinick testified about his opponent's campaign contributions, he insisted that they were motivated by politics and unfairly influenced the decision-making process. And although Mr. Havinick has been litigating this matter for two years, he waited until last week 
for the very first time to question George Skabeen's integrity or to bring Terry McAuliffe's name into the fight. I think anyone following this matter closely now knows both allegations are thoroughly discredited. By this point, it's absolutely clear that the Hudson Casino decision was heavily lobbied by both sides. The chairman said that we reject that there was political in, uh, activities to try to get this casino application approved. I don't deny there were political activities to get it approved, and it's clear there were political activities to get it disapproved. But the question is not whether there were political activities involved. The question is whether those political activities determine the outcome. And there is no evidence whatsoever that the decision was made for any other reason than on the merits and under the testimony by those who made it uh, without any kind of political interference. I'm sure Secretary uh, Babbitt's testimony today will focus in part on the different recollections he and Paul Eckstein have regarding their meeting on July 14, 1995. Mr. Babbitt has already testified in the Senate on this issue, and I'm not sure we'll learn anything new today but I'm glad he's taken the time to be with us. Um, I want to add another point. The name of Harold Ickes has been bandied about as if Harold Ickes must have been the key man who exerted the political interference. Well, it's rather shameful, it seems to me, that when the chairman of the committee makes accusations about Harold Ickes' involvement, he's not even given Harold Ickes the courtesy of asking him whether he was involved. If we're trying to get to the truth, why not ask a man who's been accused or presumed to have done something whether he did it? We have heard from Harold Ickes, and he's denied being involved. Now, we've also heard from the chairman that there is a Carter-appointed judge who has, according to the chairman, found significant evidence of political interference. Let's get the record straight. Judge Crabb said, in looking at this litigation by Mr. Havnick and his partners, that uh, there is considerable evidence that suggests that improper political pressure may have influenced agency decision making. It is necessary to allow extra record discovery uncover whether that is true. You never hear them read that last part of her sentence. All she said was, there's evidence. We don't know whether it's true or not. Therefore, in the litigation, we're going to allow discovery to see if uh, evidence can be found to substantiate this kind of accusation. She didn't buy this line, and it's unfair to attribute that line to her. One uh, final point, Mr. Chairman. Yesterday, you rejected my request that this committee issue subpoenas relating to the Newt Gingrich, Trent Lott tobacco scandal. The facts, as you may remember, are that the tobacco industry is the biggest contributor to the Republican Party. There's not even a close second. They are the biggest contributor to the Republican Party. They hired uh, Haley Barber, who was the chairman of the Republican Party to lobby for them. And then they got the Republican Senate leader, Trent Lott, and the Republican speaker, Newt Gingrich, to sneak into a bill without anybody knowing about it, a $50 billion tax break for the tobacco industry. Mr. Chairman, yesterday you said we weren't going to look at this because the Commerce Committee has jurisdiction over the uh, tobacco legislation. But as I pointed out to you, the Commerce Committee is not conducting a a, a, uh, an investigation on campaign finance issues. Our committee is doing that. Uh, in addition, we have a, another committee of the House called the Natural Resources Committee, which has jurisdiction over the Hudson Casino issue and the whole idea of Indian trust land and whether they should be gambling on or off the reservations. That's not our committee's jurisdiction. It's the uh, Natural Resources Committee. And they're conducting their own investigation on this same issue. They'll probably have all the same witnesses and all the same characters will be in the audience. 
and we'll hear all the same testimony over and over again with all the same charges, even though there's no evidence to back up these charges. But the fact that we have another committee of the House that has legislative jurisdiction over this issue didn't keep us from looking at the question of whether there was improper political interference because of campaign contributions. By the same logic, we ought to be holding a hearing on the tobacco scandal. We ought to be looking at whether the campaign contributions to the Republican Party influenced this sneaking into the budget bill a $50 billion tax break. I realize I'm not going to change your mind. I think you've made an arbitrary and partisan decision, but I have no intention of giving up on my demand for these subpoenas. And I'm going to appeal your decision, Mr. Chairman, to the full committee uh, and will insist that we vote on this matter when we next meet. If any scandal deserves our attention, it's the $50 billion tax break Newt Gingrich and Trent Lott gift wrapped for uh, the tobacco industry. That uh, concludes my statement. I'm pleased the Secretary is here. Uh, I'm looking forward to his testimony. This, these four days, extraordinary, extraordinary to have four days devoted to this issue, I think has set out the record very clearly and uh, let the, the facts speak for themselves. And when the facts speak for themselves, I think that we realize that what we have are allegations based on innuendo and allegations that are based on partisanship without substantiating evidence to uh, make those allegations stick. Yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Mr. Waxman. Secretary Babbitt, would you please rise? You swear to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth shall be done. I do. Please be seated. Mr. Babbitt, you have an opening statement you'd like to uh, read. We, we'd like to, if possible, uh, keep it as close to five minutes as, as, as we can, but if, uh, if, you, if you feel you need to go further, we will allow it. Uh, if you can condense it into five minutes, we'll submit the rest for the record. Mr. Babbitt. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, I appear today in response to your request to discuss the record of the Hudson Casino matter. The committee, of course, has every right to look into the record. And we, at the Interior Department, have every right to a fair and impartial hearing. Someone once said that facts do not cease to exist just because they are ignored. Mr. Chairman, there are those with a vested financial interest in this matter who would have you <coughs> and members of this committee turn a blind eye to the facts of the case so they can peddle their half-baked theory of improper political influence and intrigue. They would like you to ignore the voluminous record, the hours of sworn testimony by dedicated and hard-working civil servants in the Interior Department, and have you believe a conspiracy theory worthy of Oliver Stone. But efforts to obscure the truth will not and cannot change the facts. The fact is that the decision in the Hudson Casino matter was firmly grounded in the law. It was consistent with department practice and based on the merits of the case. The fact is it was the right decision made in the right way and for the right reason. This was not, as some have portrayed it, a rich tribe, poor tribe saga. This casino was a business proposition developed by a well-financed, out-of-state gambling company. That gambling company, itself headed by a Democratic Party contributor, hired its own lobbyists and tried to capitalize on an old friendship with me to push through a deficient application over the legitimate objections of the local communities. They wanted to make the federal government a participant in their scheme to add a money-making casino to a money-losing dog track. The decision to reject their plan was reached entirely on the merits, and it was entirely reasonable. Now, both the proponents and opponents of the casino tried to use intermediaries with special access to influence the decision. One side allegedly tried to misuse its political contacts 
outside the Interior Department. The other side tried to misuse personal access to me. I consider both, pro both approaches to be inappropriate. Political affiliation should have nothing to do with a decision like this, and it didn't. Campaign contributions should have nothing to do with a decision like this, and they didn't. A personal relationship with the Secretary of the Interior should have nothing to do with a decision like this, and it didn't. At this committee's request, the Department has now produced thousands of documents about this case and how the decision was made. If you look at the record as a whole and do not simply take snippets of conversations out of context, you will see that the responsible government officials who had no personal stake in whether a Florida gambling empire should be allowed to add a money-making casino to a money-losing dog track came to a consensus decision based on the law and department practice. And they got it right. As secretary, I am ultimately answerable for the department's decision. If you disagree with one of them, you have every right to criticize me. But it crosses the line of fairness and common decency to attack the integrity of the staff of this department, especially the civil service staff. They are dedicated and honorable men and women. They acted properly, and they made their recommendations on the merits. And there is not an iota of credible evidence suggesting otherwise. A number of myths have been deliberately created about this decision. Let me discuss some of them. Myth number one. It was somehow unique and unusual for the department to disagree with the <coughs> approval recommendation that came up from Minneapolis by the Bureau of Indian Affairs. The reality is that the review of the local decision was routine. My Republican predecessor, Manuel Lujan, required the department to review all off-reservation gaming applications in Washington. Why? To ensure uniform and consistent application of the law and department practice. And in this administration, we have continued that practice. Therefore, it was absolutely routine to review the area office recommendation. Not unusual for the department in Washington to have a different opinion. In fact, of the nine off-reservation applications approved by a BIA regional office since the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act was passed in 1988. Only one has led to the creation of an active off-reservation casino. In that case, unlike Hudson, the casino was supported by the surrounding community. Where there is substantial and well-founded community opposition instead of support, our practice is to reject the application. And we're not the first. In 1992, although the local BIA office, BIA office recommended approval, Secretary Lujan denied an application by the Santee Sioux Tribe of Nebraska, which wanted to open a casino in a community that had demonstrated substantial opposition. We have never approved an application in this administration that did not have community support. Myth number two, the Hudson application was headed for department approval, but somehow uh, it got derailed. The reality is that the decision to reject the application was based on the law, consistent with department practice, and was never opposed by any staff member in the department's Washington headquarters. Now, the law passed by Congress properly makes it more difficult for an off-reservation casino to be approved. It also requires us to give great weight to the sentiments of the local community. And because of the law, 
This application was controversial, and it was troubled from the moment its consideration began at the department. Now, you've heard the testimony of the department officers who participated in making the decision. And as these officials have testified to you, not a single person in the Washington office ever recommended approval of the Hudson Casino application. And no one in the Washington office ever wrote a memorandum recommending approval of the casino. The decision to reject the application was in full accord with the recommendation of the senior civil servant, George Scabee. For Mr. Scabine and others at Interior in Washington, the principal remaining issue was not whether to deny the application, but whether to rest the denial on the Indian Reorganization Act, the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act, or both. Deficiencies in the application were also apparent to the National Indian Gaming Commission, a quasi-independent body not subject to my review. Three weeks before the department decision, the National Indian Gaming Commission sent the Florida Gambling Company and the applicant tribes a letter stating that the application did not contain sufficient information to warrant approval. The decision to deny the application was also consistent with the department practice. We do not allow a tribe to place a casino far from its own reservation in a community where there is substantial and well-founded opposition to it. I'm gratified to learn from the record of these hearings today that this committee, Republicans and Democrats alike, agree with this practice. In the Hudson case, the opposition of the surrounding community was widespread, it was legitimate, it was bipartisan. Community political leaders including many members of Congress, expressed their opposing views. And in contrast to this opposition, to my knowledge, not a single member of Congress went on record in support of the Hudson application. Now, the gambling interests financing this application, they knew about the deficiencies in their application, but they could not overcome the community opposition problem for a simple reason, and that's because they were anchored to Hudson by their interest in bailing out their failing dog track. We took the views of community political leaders in Hudson, the city council, formal opposition in Troy, city town council formal opposition, the St. Croix tribe formal opposition into consideration. It was entirely appropriate in the decision-making process. As I'm sure members of this committee would agree. Myth number three, the supposed derailment was somehow caused by improper political influence. The reality is that the participants inside the decision-making process based their decision on the merits of the case. And the questionable behavior of lobbyists on both sides of this issue did not affect the decision. If the allegations are correct that Lobbyists who opposed the application attempted to inject improper political considerations into Interior's decision-making process. Well, they failed. As the testimony before you has shown, the Interior officials involved in the decision were unaware of, and therefore could not possibly have been influenced by, any of the improper political arguments that advocates of the opposing tribes are reported to have made. I was personally unaware of any such improper political efforts by the opposing tribes, as were the other interior officials who actually participated in deciding the Hudson matter. Any improper political message simply did not get through. <coughs> to be specific, I was unaware of communications the lobbyists for the opposing tribes are alleged to have had with the President and his advisors in the White House. I did not hear about them from the opposing tribes lobbyists, and I did not hear about them from Harold Dickey or anyone else at the White House. Neither, as they have testified, did my personal staff or the Indian Affairs officials, including the career civil servants who worked on the matter. The department's officials have been deposed and redeposed under oath. 
George Skabane, for example, a career civil servant of impeccable reputation, was deposed twice and appeared before this committee and the Senate committee for a total of 16 hours of sworn testimony. They've answered the same questions again and again. And their testimony confirms what I say. Myth number four. The White House inquiries into this matter were attempts to influence the Hudson decision. The reality is that these White House inquiries, which critics of my department have mischaracterized to further their conspiracy theory, were entirely benign and utterly routine. They involve status checks made by staff assistants. The staff at Interior recognized the status checks as routine and treated them as such. I was unaware of these inquiries at the time. When I answered the July 1996 letter from Senator McCain, more than a year after the Hudson decision, I attached a staff memo describing such inquiries. Myth number five. Somehow I was the conduit by which White House influence was transmitted uh, to interior decision makers. The reality is that the conduit theory is a fantasy. I never communicated with anyone at the White House or the Democratic National Committee about the Hudson matter. And because I had previously delegated my authority in such gaming matters to subordinates, I did not participate in the department's decision. Thus, as I've said previously, the conduit theory fails because there was no connection at either end of the alleged conduit. The speculation and innuendo about my role simply does not survive an examination of the facts. Mr. Chairman, the record regarding the department's Hudson Casino decision shows that it was the right decision made in the right way for the right reasons. But I must acknowledge my own mistake in what I said about it when I granted the casino lobbyist's last-minute request to meet with me. On July 11, 1995, as the department was close to announcing the decision to deny the application, I received a telephone call from an old friend and former law partner, Paul Eckstein, who had been hired by the gambling company supporting the application. Mr. Eckstein asked to meet with me. I asked one of my counselors, John Duffy, to meet with him. Mr. Duffy met with Mr. Eckstein on July 14th, the earliest date Mr. Eckstein could get to Washington. Later that day, Mr. Eckstein asked to see me without an appointment. When I reluctantly agreed to meet with him, he told me that Mr. Duffy had said the rejection decision was imminent. He then asked me to delay it so his clients could make a final presentation. I declined. Unfortunately, I made up an excuse in an effort to end the meeting. To the best of my recollection, I said that Harold Dickey's wanted or expected the department to make a decision promptly. It was indulgent of me to see Mr. Eckstein, and it was a mistake to invoke Harold Ickes' name. Fact is, I never spoke with Mr. Ickes about the Hudson matter, and I shouldn't have given Mr. Eckstein any reason to suppose that I had. I regret the remark. It was a mistake, but that's all it was. Mr. Chairman, let me now turn to my own prior statements about this matter because they've been the basis for some unfair and unsupportable accusations that have been leveled at me. I told the truth when I wrote to Senator McCain about this matter. I told the truth when I wrote to Senator Thompson. I told the truth when I testified before the Senate Government Affairs Committee, and I'm telling the truth today. The letters to Senator McCain and Thompson are consistent on the central point of this inquiry, and they are truthful on the different issues they address. Both letters state that I never discussed the Hudson matter with Harold Dickey. In the McCain letter, I disputed Mr. Eckstein's version of our conversation. In the Thompson letter, I provided my own best recollection of that conversation. The context of the two letters was different and accounts for the different language in the document. As I have testified, never spoke with Harold Dickies or anyone else at the White House about the Hudson matter. 
When I wrote Senator McCain in August 1996 after the Eckstein meeting, 13 months after it occurred, that is what I told Senator McCain. That is also what I told Senator Thompson in my letter of October 10, 1997. That was my sworn testimony on October 30, 1997. Mr. Chairman, the voluminous record in this matter demonstrates that denying the application, the right decision, made the right way, and for the right reasons. I've been in public service for 23 years, and during that time I've worked hard to earn a reputation for integrity and independence. The attacks on my integrity are uncalled for, they're unwarranted, and I must tell you, I deeply resent them. I am determined to do everything I can to prevent my reputation and the reputation of George Scabee, Mike Anderson, and other dedicated individuals in the department from being tarnished by a controversy manufactured by the losers to take advantage of the corrosive political atmosphere that surrounds this city at this time. The test of the Department's action in the Hudson decision should not be what was said or done outside the decision-making process by private individuals who had a vested interest in the decision. The test should be what was said and done inside the process by those who have a responsibility to serve the public interest. Those individuals have testified before you and have vouched for the integrity of their actions in the Hudson matter. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, with a clear and certain conscience, so do I. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Uh, let me preface my remarks by saying that uh, we are not uh, impugning the integrity of any of the civil servants. What we're trying to do is we're trying to get at the facts regarding possible uh, political influence being exerted into this matter uh, through political contributions and, and other avenues. And uh, we're, we're concerned that uh, decisions uh, that or recommendations were made in Ashland, Wisconsin by the career staff and uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota by the career staff was reversed at the top levels of our government in the Interior Department and whether or not those decisions were reversed because of political contributions which came in. And so we're not trying to impugn the integrity of any of the civil servants because we believe that by and large they do a very good job. Now, Mr. Secretary, are you prepared to represent today to the House that uh, all, all responsive documents that have been subpoenaed have been produced to this committee? Mr. Chairman, to the very best of my knowledge, this department has uh, undertaken the most exhaustive search we have ever made and produced every single document that we have found. Yes. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. Mr. Chairman, that. can we have the Secretary pull the microphone a little closer? Yes, would you pull the mic a little closer, Mr. Secretary? We want to make sure we under hear, hear you very well. Uh, the reason I ask that question is because we've asked uh, the counsel for the President on a number of occasions if we had all the documents, and they say we do, and then two or three weeks later we get another two or three boxes and so on. So we just want to yeah, make Mr. sure. Mr. Chairman, I can only answer for the interior well, I understand. Department. I understand, Mr. Babbitt. Uh, could you tell us what you have personally done to make sure that uh, all the records uh, that we have asked for uh, uh, have been provided? Uh, Mr. Chairman, the document search was conducted under a process uh, that was established by the solicitor. He is here, and I'm certain he could uh, provide you that information. But to the best of your knowledge, we have all the documents we were yes. Okay. You yourself have indicated that you wanted all the facts and the information out in keeping with your commitment, this committee voted yesterday to make all of the documents pertaining to this investigation public, so I thought we'd inform you of that. We intend to turn these documents over to the Chairman of the Interior Committee, Chairman Young, and Chairman Pombo, Chairman of the Subcommittee and the Resources Committee, uh, to further review these matters and address any legislative uh, remedies that need to, be, uh, need to be passed. Now, in, in a deposition last fall with the Senate, your longtime close friend, which, to whom you alluded in your opening remarks, a law school classmate and former campaign manager, Paul Eckstein, uh, testified under oath before the Senate Governmental Affairs Committee as follows regarding the rejection of the Hudson Casino application on July 14, 1995. Quote, the secretary, Secretary Babbitt, responded that he had been directed by Harold Ickes to issue the decision that day. 
And the secretary said at some point when we were standing up, he asked me rhetorically, do you know how much I believe it was these tribes had contributed to either the Democrat Party or the Democrat candidates or the DNC? I said, I don't have the slightest idea. And he responded by saying, well, it's in the order of a half a million dollars or something like that. Now, Mr. Secretary, in your opening remarks, you alluded to part of that statement, but you didn't say anything about uh, the comment that he's talking about here where you said, are you aware of how much money is given to the DNC by these individuals? Now, do you recall that saying that to him? Mr. Chairman, uh, that assertion, as I understand it, uh, by Mr. Eckstein, did not appear in his affidavit uh, filed uh, in uh, the civil litigation. It is my understanding that that assertion uh, was made for the first time uh, several months ago uh, in the context of, uh, a, uh, of the Thompson Committee hearings. Yes, Mr. Secretary. I have, I have no recollection of such a discussion. So, so you're saying that Mr. Eckstein uh, uh, was in error when he said that? Mr. Chairman, I can only tell you that I have no recollection of that, of such a but, discussion. But you, you recall part of the statement. I mean, in your opening remarks, you referred to about half of what Mr. Eckstein uh, alleged was said. But the part that uh, uh, alludes to, uh, do you know how much these Indian tribes give in contributions, you did not recall. I mean, so you recall half of it, but not the other half? Uh, I have no recollection of such a discussion. Now, Mr. Secretary, you initially uh, de denied uh, this account in your uh, July 14th, 1995 meeting with Mr. Eckstein in, in this letter to Senator McCain on August 30th, 1996, didn't you? Uh, no, I did not. That's not correct. Well, you said, uh, I must regretfully dispute Mr. Eckstein's assertion that I told him that Mr. Ickes instructed me to issue a decision in this matter without delay. Now, that's a direct quote from your letter. Well, uh, let me, if I may, Mr. Chairman. Uh, First of all, uh, that, let that, me put up on the screen, if I might, so everyone can see it. That's the, exhibit, exhibit 337A1 through A2. Uh, my letter of August 30th was in response to uh, Senator McCain's letter of July 19th. Mm -hmm. Now, here is what Senator McCain asked me um, in the July 19th letter. He says, Mr. Eckstein has sworn that you told him that Ickes had called you and told you the decision had to be issued that day. Now, I did not tell him that Ickes had called me. I did not tell him that Ickes had told me that the decision had to be issued that day. And in my response to Senator McCain, I said I must regretfully dispute Mr. Eckstein's assertion that I told him that Mr. Ickes instructed me uh, etc. Now, uh, what is... That's a fine, fine line you're drawing there. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, that's not a fine line. It's not a fine line at all. Uh, Senator McCain is saying, uh, did you tell him that Ickes had called you? The answer is, I did not. Uh, did, uh, did you say that Ickes told me that the decision had to be issued that day? No. And it's not a very fine line. It's a bright line. Well, so, so now your story is that you did say something... Uh, Mr. Chairman, that's not my story now. That's contained in a letter that was written on August 30th, 1996. Mr. Secretary, if you would, let me conclude my questions, and then I'll allow you adequate time for answering. If you wouldn't interrupt me, I'll, I'll try not to interrupt you. And now your story is that you did say something to this effect, and in particular you stated in an October 10th, 1997 letter to Senator Thompson, quote, I do believe Mr. Eckstein's recollection that I said something to the effect that Mr. Ickes wanted a decision is correct. Uh, you said that, uh, what was it? That's exhibit uh, 345B1 and 2. You recall that? Yes. And then during your testimony on October 30th, 1997, you stated, quote, I don't recall exactly what was said, but on reflection, I probably said that Mr. Ickes wanted the department or expected the department to decide the matter promptly. That's Exhibit 366-2. And in your Senate testimony, you explained this change in your story as just an excuse to get Mr. Eckstein out of your office. Isn't that correct? Uh, in my testimony 
uh, in, in the Thompson letter, uh, I said that Mr. Rickey's, my best recollection of what I said to Eckstein is that Hickey's wanted or expected a decision promptly. Now, <clears throat> that is not in conflict with my response to Senator McCain. And you don't recall saying anything about the money that the Indian tribes contributed? You don't recall anything about that? I do not recall a discussion to that effect. Mr. Eckstein was your close personal friend and campaign manager and confidant, and he obviously just made that up. I do not recall a discussion to that effect. Yet uh, you are aware that Mr. Eckstein testified that uh, you made that statement about Harold Ickes at the beginning of your meeting and he continued to stay in your office, isn't that correct? Mr. Chairman, I don't recall exactly when the issue of Harold Ickes arose. I can tell you that I made an excuse to, to ease a... I had told Mr. Eckstein I couldn't do anything for him. Well, and I made an excuse uh, to the effect that, look, I've got to get this, I've got to get this done. Ickes expects or wants me to make a decision promptly. But in your Senate testimony, you indicated that it was at the uh, end of the meeting when you stood up and, and he was leaving. That uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I did not. Uh, I did not indicate that. Uh, I, be, uh, which Senate testimony are you referring to? Well, it was, it was at the beginning or the end of the meeting that, uh, that you made this comment to Mr. Ickes. Do you recall? Mr. Chairman, I, I do not. Recall. Don't recall. And is it still your testimony today that the only reason you mentioned uh, Harold Ickes was to get Mr. Eckstein out of your office? That's correct. To, to. So of all the people at the I, White I, House... I, I, made, I made an excuse. Obviously, uh, I regret having made that excuse, but that's what it was. Nothing more. But you lied to your friend. I made an excuse to... Was it truthful that him. you talked to Mr. Ickes? Was it truthful that Mr. Ickes asked you to do anything on this? Uh, and, if in, he, and if you didn't in, have any in, contact and he didn't, then you misled in, your friend. In the McCain letter, uh, I was asked uh, whether uh, Ickes had called me and told me the decision had to be answered. My, my response to Senator McCain was, I dispute that. I didn't say that. That's my test. That's my letter of August 30th, 1996, and it's my testimony today. So of all the people at the White House whose names you could have invoked, such as uh, Chief of Staff Panetta or others uh, in leadership there or anybody else, you chose Harold Dickey's name to invoke. Uh, and uh, why did you pick Harold Dickey's name? Um, simply because Harold Dickey's was my liaison on these kinds of interior matters at the White House. And he was deeply involved in the fundraising aspects of the... White House and, and the Democrat National Committee. Uh, and are, are you, you're aware that Mr. Ickey's office had been asked by numerous sources to influence this decision, are you not? Uh, as a result of the testimony in these proceedings, yes, I am aware of it. And you're aware that Mr. Ickey's was contacted by DNC Chairman Don Fowler, who pleaded the case for the Hudson Casino opponents. That was in uh, May 5th memo, exhi exhi exhibit number 310. Uh, and I direct your attention to the top of the memo, which denotes uh, Democrat or DNC supporters oppose the project. DNC, DNC supporters oppose the project. Um, yes, I, uh, I see the memo. I, okay. I, I'm not sure. Okay. I don't believe I've, I've seen this memo before. I okay. know it's in the record. But this is one of these endless communications outside the interior process and I have therefore not spent much time uh, with them. I, I may have read this. No, I don't think I have. Are you aware that Mr. Ickes was contacted by Mr. Schneider uh, at or around uh, May 16, 1995, uh, and uh, who asked that Mr. Ickes contact the Interior Department on behalf of uh, the opposing tribes? That's exhibit number 346. Mr. O'Connor testified to that effect yesterday. Uh, I, I'm sorry, testified Mr. to what? Mr. O'Connor testified to, to, to that effect that uh, uh, 
Mr. Ickes uh, was contacted by his uh, partner, Mr. Schneider, on or about uh, May 16, 1995, and asked that he contact Mr. Yeah. Ickes. Well, I think I can say without having seen the memo uh, that I had no knowledge of that. It's interesting, though, that uh, this is a real coincidence that uh, Mr. Schneider and Mr. Fowler and others were talking to Ickes uh, about this matter and asking him to, uh, even the president uh, uh, asked that Mr. Ickes look into it. Mr. Ickes uh, was asked by a number of people to look into this and uh, uh, talk to the Interior Department about it. And uh, you mentioned to your former partner and friend and campaign manager that Mr. Ickes was uh, asking that this thing uh, be denied. Uh, and it, it just seems like a real coincidence of all the people at the White House, that's the one you mentioned to Mr. Eckstein. Don't you think that's an unusual coincidence? Mr. Chairman, you can manufacture all the conspiracies you want. But the plain fact is that at the end of the day, the facts are the facts, and I have just given them to you. Are you aware of a May 18, 1995 memo to Harold Ickes from his staff, which indicated that the Interior Department staff had made the decision to reject the uh, casino application in a May 17, 1995 uh, memo? And Could you give us an exhibit number, please? Uh, that's exhibit 312. Pardon me. Yes, I believe I saw this memo for the first time in the course of the uh, Thompson Committee uh, okay. investigation. Do, do you know why a decision that was supposedly not made until two months later was being represented to uh, Harold Ickes as having been assi essentially decided? Uh, wh 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 where does it say that? That's it. The date of the memo is uh, May 17th, the memo you have before you. Or May 18th. And that memo to Harold Ickes from his staff indicated that the Interior Department had made the decision. This was from his staff. It says staff met last night and came up with a preliminary decision which will likely not be final for another month. The staff believes it is probably a bad idea to create the trust land to allow the establishment of the casino. Their reasons are as follows, and it goes on. But this memo was uh, two months before uh, the decision was made. And uh, can you explain Mr. Chairman, that? sure. You've heard uh, testimony from George Scabine, from Tom Hartman, from Mike Anderson, from John Duffy, from other officials who have described uh, in great detail the process of consensus-based discussion that moved this decision uh, through the process toward the final decision made by Mike Anderson. Well, what I don't understand, Mr. Secretary, is this was a confidential memo, and the Indian tribes that were making the application who should have been involved in the process to try to correct any problems that may have occurred weren't even aware of it. And yet it appears as though from this memo that was sent to Mr. Ickes, for what reason I know not, other than to inform him that the application was probably going to be declined, that, uh, that the uh, decision had already been made or was about to be made, and it wasn't made known until two months later, and the Indian tribes that were going to be turned down uh, weren't even made aware of it or given an opportunity, uh, which should have been the case, according to the law as I understand it, weren't even informed about this. Why is that? Mr. Chairman, I, uh, you're incorrect. Those facts are uh, simply not well, supported in the Well, explain to me why record. I'm incorrect. You've heard testimony from... Uh, George Scabine, uh, and I believe others, that the tribes were consulted with, they met with officials in the department during that time, and those issues were discussed, and that's clearly laid out in the record. Well, the, the, the tribe, uh, tribes in question weren't even involved uh, of the meeting for, what was it, six weeks? Six weeks. Mr. Chairman, George Scabine, testified to that very issue just crystal clear. He said he was, as I recall, yeah. uh, how he came to the department, uh, how those letters uh, went out, and to the subsequent well, course of consultation. The Indian tribes that testified before us said they were not involved in any meetings. They did not know about that until six Chairman, the record clearly shows to the contrary. The record, I don't believe, shows that. Uh, 
we, 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 I won't get into all the details, but the Scabine testimony does not reflect that. Uh, are Mr. you aware Chairman? that Mr. Ickes has little memory of any of these contacts or events? Uh, I have not discussed this matter uh, with Harold Ickes, and uh, I uh, did not watch his testimony uh, to the Thompson Committee. And uh, Has he testified to this committee? No, uh, the reason he did not testify for this committee, and I'll uh, answer my colleague, uh, Mr. Waxman's comments that were made, is because uh, he was deposed by the Senate. We did have access to those depositions, and he testified. So we pretty much had the, the information we wanted from Mr. Ickes. We didn't want to be any more redundant. And the, my colleagues on the other side have concerned, uh, uh, been concerned about redundancy, so we wanted to accommodate them. <laughs> Scabine said, uh, incidentally, this is the question, but prior to the rejection of the application, uh, that is the easy way to do it, to tell people in advance what the problems are and to let, uh, let them cure them. And his answer was, yes, we could have done that. That is not the way I did this first application. That is not the way we did it at this point. So as far as informing them. Mr. Chairman, I, I, I disagree. The record. Well, this is Mr. Scabine's testimony. The, the, the record That's a direct quote clearly from shows that these folks had ample opportunity to discuss their application uh, with department officials. Now, in addition to that, in the record, there is a transcript of my discussion with the Wisconsin tribes, uh, I believe in early April at the listening conference uh, that I held in Wisconsin. Uh, these are regular events that I uh, hold statewide with Indian tribes uh, on a on an irregular basis. Uh, uh, the Wisconsin Listening Conference uh, involved a general discussion of this issue. And from my own perspective, I clearly laid out in, a, in my remarks, and there's a transcript of them, wow. that the issue with off-reservation gaming was the issue of community support. And I said, this department is not willing to cram casinos down the throats of unwilling communities. Mr. And I Babbitt. explained it in some detail. Thank you, I Mr. Mean, Secretary. Just let, let me move on because we have a limited amount of time. And I, if you could keep your answers as concise as possible, it would help us expedite this. Uh, are you aware that Mr. Fowler sometimes uh, remembers little about these events except that he contacted someone unknown at the Interior Department? And would you, would, you have, would you happen to have learned from anyone who that person he contacted might be? Uh, I, have, uh, I have asked that question, and the answer is uh, that uh, it, we have not been able to document a who it was he call by Fowler to which someone actually responded and talked with Mr. Fowler. I can tell you that it was not me. Well, see, one of the things that's troubling to us is Mr. Ickes doesn't remember, Mr. Fowler doesn't remember, you don't know anybody over at the department that was contacted, and yet Mr. Fowler says he did contact someone. So it is troubling when we're trying to get at the facts when people have this, this memory loss. Now, let me give you some examples of the coincidences here. Yesterday, Mr. O'Connor, DNC trustee and lobbyist for the wealthy tribes opposing this application, testified that on July 14, 1990, no application, and that's Exhibit uh, 328, his billing records for that day which is Exhibit 356-45, reflect his reference to fundraising strategy. And he says, quote, Harold Ickes, Terry McAuliffe, and DNC Chairman Don Fowler, end quote. Doesn't that seem like a remarkable coincidence, Mr. Secretary, that he refers to all of them? Same, day, sir, same day, July 14th, that this meeting took place? Mr. Chairman, half the lobbyists in this town claim credit for the sunrise at least once a week. <laughs> and it's pretty clear to me, I've not seen, those things were happening outside the department. And I have and had no knowledge of what's going on outside the department. But uh, it doesn't seem unusual for a lobbyist to get set to claim credit as the sun comes over the horizon. Are you aware uh, that Mr. Ickes was a central person at the White House overseeing fundraising for the DNC and the Clinton-Gore 96 campaign? I believe that I was aware that Harold Ickes was the White House person 
uh, managing the campaign, was the person managing the campaign uh, in the White House, managing the campaign. Yeah, I was aware of that. So you were aware that Mr. Ickes was deeply involved in the uh, fundraising aspects of the, of the campaign of the DNC? Well, I, I was aware that he was involved in the management of the campaign. Now, on the day that you invoked uh, Mr. Ickey's name and Mr. Eckstein said that you asked him if he knew how much money these people raised, this was just one day after Mr. O'Connor's partner and longtime friend of the president, Tom Schneider, held a fundraiser for Clinton Gore 96. This fundraiser netted close to half a million dollars, $420,000 to be exact. And this is just another coincidence you would assert, I presume. I was not aware of that fundraiser. And just so there's no uh, confusion, Mr. Secretary, your testimony before this committee is that Harold Ickes, Don Fowler, none of these people contacted you at any time, alerting you to the political considerations in this decision, and that the decision to reject the application was made for a casino at the dog track was based solely on the merits by career officials at the Interior Department. That's correct? That, that is correct. I had no contact on this matter with Ickes or Fowler. Who, who was the third one? I beg your pardon, sir? Uh, he gave me three names. I said I had no contact with Ickes. I had none with Fowler. No, I, I mentioned uh, Ickes and Fowler. That's okay. It. I've had no communication. I had no communication with them. This decision was the right decision. It was made in the right way, and it was made for the right reasons. In light of the testimony we've heard over the three days of our hearings, I'd like to question you in regards to some of the representations that uh, you uh, made in your opening statements. Essentially, you said that the decision was made by career officials of the Department of the Interior, uh, not influenced uh, in any way by the political concerns. Is that correct? The decision was made by Michael Anderson. He is a presidential appointee. So he's a political appointee. Michael, An the, the decision was made by Michael Anderson, a, poli the, a political appointee, yes. In your testimony, I, I, I drew from that that, uh, that the career employees, the career people at the, at the Interior Department was making most of the recommendations and making the decisions, yes, like I, Mr. Scabine. I, I, I think the intent um, of the testimony, I, I, I suppose I should look at the language, was to emphasize that at the career level in the department. So, Mr. Uh, Scabine and others. George but, Scabine. Mr., but Mr. Anderson's the one that made the final decision and signed it. He was a political appointee of the president. Sure, he did that on the recommendation of, uh, of Scabine. Uh, in fact, one of the chiefs of the tribes testified before this committee about Mr. Anderson's political activities for the Clinton campaign in 1992 while he was uh, with the American Congress of Indians. Are you aware of that? Uh, I don't believe that I even knew Michael Anderson until he came to the department. I believe that I was aware uh, when he came to the department that he had been an official with the National Congress um, of American Indians, but that's the extent of my biographical knowledge of Michael Anderson uh, prior to recent events and testimony. Mr. Secretary, you repeated before this committee the same statement that you made before the Senate Government Affairs Committee that the department based its decision solely on the criteria set forth in Section 20 of the Indian Regulatory Gaming Act. In fact, are you aware that Mr. Scabine, the career Interior Department official who did not sign the rejection letter, testified last week that your statement was incorrect? That's uh, Exhibit 390 and 390.1. Uh, when I said that the uh, decision was based on the criteria uh, contained in the um, uh, in IGRA, in Indian Gaming Regulatory Act, the Essentially, the same criteria are contained in uh, the decision-making process in both. Those criteria apply, uh, and I think it's clear that that's quite clear from the letter of decision. Those criteria, detriment to the community, benefit to the tribe, are the same ones that are used on either side. In fact, uh, you had to rely on a 1934 act uh, to use your discretion to reject this application rather than solely relying upon Section 20. Isn't that correct? Well, the, the decision letter speaks for itself, and the answer is that the decision letter relies on both. 
and you are aware that the career officials had recommended against using Section 20 in the rejection rationale, by, but your counsel, Mr. Duffy, who now works for your old law firm, insisted that Section 20 be cited in the rejection letter? Mr. Chairman, I'm mystified by how this discussion uh, enters your conspiracy theory. Um, the fact is that there was a lively debate. The record shows a lively debate in the department about uh, the grounds for decision. Either would be an adequate ground. Now, I believe that the people who have testified here have explained what that debate was about. I'd be happy to try to recollect their testimony, but it's out there and it's on the record yeah, well, and it's let's, crystal let's clear. Go, let's, go to the, let's go to some of the facts then. Uh, in 1995 in July, uh, and this is Exhibit 323, an email communication from Kevin Meisner to George Scabine. It was dated July 6, 1995. Quote, the bald objections of surrounding communities, including Indian tribes, are not enough evidence of detriment to the surrounding communities to find under Section 20 of the Act that the acquisition for the gaming will be detrimental to the surrounding communities. Now, with respect to uh, your assertion in your statement, that a career civil servant's recommendation was not overruled, I would refer you to Exhibit 317A, which is a June 8, 1995 draft, draft recommending approval of the application, which specifically states, quote, the staff recommends that the secretary, based on the following, determine that the proposed acquisition would not be detrimental to the surrounding community. In fact, the ultimate rejection letter of July 14th did overrule this career, career civil servant's recommendation, didn't it? Mr. Chairman, going back to the, let's see, this is Exhibit 323. and 317A. Is, okay, this is from Kevin Meisner. Now, we had two there. Exhibit 323E was an email from Kevin Meisner to George Scabine. That okay. was July now, 6, 1995. And the last one I alluded to was Exhibit 317A. Okay, now, uh, I'm not speaking from my personal knowledge. I'm speaking from these documents and what I understand uh, has already been said on the record, and I believe that's quite clear, that uh, Meisner's view of this was rejected in the solicitor's office by Bob Anderson, uh, and I think John Duffy talked about this yesterday as well. Bob Anderson and John Duffy both were political appointees, were they not? I don't know. And yeah. John Duffy and your former chief of staff both left your staff after the decision was made, one, but one before and one after the decision was made to kill this application for the tribes in question, and they went to work for your old law firm, and they both now represent the Shakopee tribe, which is one of the beneficiaries of this decision. Isn't that not, is that not correct? Mr. Chairman, I'm sorry. Are we talking about um, this document, or is that a question directed uh, about Duffy and Collier? Let me just state real quickly here something that I think needs to be made. Mr. Anderson was a political appointee. Mr. Collier was a political appointee, and Mr. Duffy was a political appointee. Mr. Anderson and Mr. Duffy were involved in the decision-making process. Mr. Duffy and Mr. Collier left your employee at the department, went to work for your old law firm. They now represent the Shakopee tribes, and uh, they have, uh, they're, they're, they're making a, a, a lot of money from the tribes that benefited from this decision. That's one of the things that concerns me a great deal. Let me proceed on further. Mr. Howard. Chairman, could I, could I respond to that? You can in just a moment. Does it trouble you, Mr. Secretary, that Mr. a Chair, judge a point of order, I think in fairness the witness ought to be able to respond to that. I think that he's the one that's testifying, if I'm correct in recollecting that, and you're the one that's asking questions. The Chair just stated very clearly that he will be able to respond and he shall be able to Sometimes respond. Sometimes separated from in, your in question. In just a moment, but idea? I'm running out of time and... We'll give you time. We'll give you time, but I think he ought to have time to respond to your question he, when your question is made, not sometimes separated later. The, chair, the chair, chair has ruled that he will have time to respond to the question, and he'll do it in just a moment. Be patient. Now, does it trouble you, in addition to the question I just asked, does it trouble you, Mr. Secretary, that a judge appointed by President Carter has noted, quote, that there is considerable evidence that suggests that improper political pressure may have influenced agency decision-making, that's Exhibit C-106. And also, since I'll let you answer both questions, I'll conclude with this one. Judge Crabb also noted that the unusual brevity of the July 14, 1995 decision when she wrote, quote, 
The Indian Gaming Management Staff first report in early February 1995 was 26 pages, and the second one dated June 8, 1995 was 17 pages. Plaintiffs pointed out also that in making a decision on a similar trust application filed by the Salt State St. Marie Indians, the department issued a 29-page decision considerably longer than the three-page decision in this case. In fact, this decision did little to explain the rationale for denying the application, didn't it, Mr. Secretary? You can answer um, all okay, those. Okay, let's see. I think I have three questions. Yes, sir, you do. To respond to. Um, with respect to the brevity of the decision document, Mr. Chairman, I think it is clear and comprehensible. If you want to compare that to department practice, I would suggest that you look at Secretary Lujan's decision uh, denying the Santee Sioux application uh, in quite comparable circumstances. Uh, that decision, dated January 23, 1992, is here. So I would respectfully suggest that before anyone buys into a brevity conspiracy, that you might sort of look at the practices in the department. Now, with respect to the, to the Crab opinion, Mr. Chairman, I think it's enormously misleading to continually throw this opinion up uh, in the way you do for this reason. Judge Crabb looked at the allegations that these gambling guys are making uh, in the pleadings in the lawsuit and looked at, looked at the paper and said, I must make a ruling that the court will hear testimony on these issues. That's what it's all about. She's saying these gambling company allegations on their face raise issues that require testimony. Now, what's the difference between that and here? The difference is very simple. You've been hearing testimony for two weeks. And what I'm saying is that any fair construction of the record that has been laid out here in the last two weeks can only lead reasonable people to one conclusion. And that is the right decision made in the right way for the right reasons. Let me, uh, just uh, before I yield to my colleague for his oh, 30 I'm, minutes. I'm sorry, there was a third question. Sure, go ahead. Uh, which I would like to respond to. And that is the issue of Duffy and Collier. I did not hear their testimony to you yesterday, but I've had it reported to me, and I would summarize their response. Congress explicitly, by legislation, authorized this kind of representation. And in fact, it was legal and entirely proper under the rules laid down by this Congress. Now, let me tell you that this first came to my attention, this matter, in April of 1993, when a former Secretary of the Interior, a Republican named Manuel Lujan, came to the Department lobbying for an Indian tribe, the Mescalero Apaches, on a casino issue which had previously been under his jurisdiction at the Department of the Interior. Now, I didn't rush after Secretary Lujan or out to the press and say, this is an outrageous example uh, of wrongdoing, because I respect Secretary Lujan. He was acting legally properly and the inference that just because somebody goes to represent a tribe automatically casts that suspicion. Well, I'd suggest you haul Manny Lujan in here and give him the kind of treatment that you've been giving uh, Duffery and Collier. Uh, before I yield to my colleague, let me just say uh, you, you've used the term conspiracy a number of times, Mr. Secretary. I don't believe that uh, Judge Crabb would be involved in that. And her statement, which is on the screen there, I think speaks for itself. Uh, Mr. Yes, Mr. Chairman, Jackson. thank you. I I'd like that statement to stay up on the screen because there's something really quite dishonest that's going on here. Uh, at the end, there are three dots. Now, three dots usually means she said something else. 
And what the, the, that exhibit does not say is what else she said. And I want to read from her opinion. However, whereas here there is, now up there, there is considerable evidence that suggests that improper political pressure may have influenced agency decision making, she goes on to say, it is necessary to allow extra record discovery to uncover whether that is true. Her next, next sentence is, many of the events of which plaintiffs complain could be considered innocent in and of themselves. Well, what is she had said in this opinion is that based on these allegations, she was going to allow them to take depositions and undertake discovery. So it, I want that to be uh, looked at in its entirety because that quote is being misused. And if, if you listen to how it's misused, it's misused when the chairman says, a Carter appointee, a Democrat. Well, I don't think it makes any difference when she was appointed by a Democrat or Republican. She's a judge. She had to make a decision not on the merits of whether there was considerable interference, but only whether she's going to allow people to look at that issue and gather evidence on it. So let's, let's get that record straight. Mr. Babbitt, uh, we, this is our last of four days of hearings. Some of the people who uh, are here today may be here for the first time. Uh, others may not be aware of what we've heard in testimony uh, consistently on this matter. We had uh, decision makers. Now, you're the one that signs the papers because you're the secretary. Like, we sign our letters. But the truth of the matter is we have aides that write those letters or draft our record statements, as you have aides who have to look at the facts and make a decision and recommendations up the line. And maybe it has your imprimatur as the final decision maker, maker but uh, others get involved. And we've had the people who were the career officials in the department testify before us. And they said they had to consider this merit, this measure, this request for a casino on the merits. And they did that, and they made their recommendations. Mr. Scabine, I think, is a 20-year career person. He looked at it at the merits and said, this application for a casino should be denied. Then his superior looked at his statement and some one of his superiors said well i agree with your decision but i think it ought to be denied on other grounds than the one you suggested and then you suggest you said to us there was a debate as to what grounds to turn it down not whether to turn it down or not but what grounds to turn it down and then uh, that went to mr hartman and uh and to mr anderson now mr anderson is a political appointee but let's don't misunderstand what political appointee means when you have a new administration as is possible every four years with the election of a president the president appoints the secretaries for the departments as you were appointed by president clinton some of the people under you were appointed by the president and then under them are career people so the po the political people who are now in, uh, required to make these decisions on the substantive issues before them in the peer in, in the department of interior got the recommendations from the career people and signed off on them. I, I want to run a videotape. It's not very artfully put together. It was quickly put together. But I, sometimes reading testimony isn't as good as seeing the people respond on the record. So if, if uh, we could get that videotape, I'd like you to see it. it, it uh, it's going to come on in a minute. And it's going to show the question. Career civil servant at the Bureau of Indian Affairs responsible for making the final staff recommendation on this matter. That is correct. Um, yes, in the Indian Gaming Office. Okay. You, were, uh, you also supervised the career staff at the central office who reviewed the application. That's correct. So if anyone is in a position to know of improper political influence, it's you. If there was imp improper political influence born to bear on the Indian Gaming Office, Yes. Okay. And in your judgment, was this decision made on the merits and only on the merits? The, my judgment is that my recommendation was made on the merits. Decision. That was Mr. Scabine, public employee. You've said to us you've made your decision on the merits without political interference. Is that your clear, unequivocal testimony? Yes, it is. 
we had testimony uh, by uh, Mr. Uh, Skabin, who said flat out the decision was based on the merits and not due to any political influence. Do you concur in that statement, Mr. Anderson? Yes, emphatically. Mr. Hartman? Yes, I concur. And Mr. J a particular way. Can you just say to us, you are under oath, whether there was any interference, whether there was any kind of uh, uh, pressure from the White House or from the Democratic Party or anyone outside the Department of Interior uh, to uh, come up with a result that uh, was uh, arrived at? I, I can, and I will. There was none. 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 And Mr. Collier, you're I also... emphatically on. agree. Well, those were the statements on the record. They involved career officials and then people who were appointed uh, as political appointees above them. They've all testified here under oath that there was no political interference. The decision was based on the merits. I'm pleased the chairman said he doesn't impugn their integrity. Uh, I, I, I think he has no basis to impugn their integrity. That's the record of these hearings. A decision was made on the marriage without political interference. But this hearing suggests that that must be wrong. It suggests that it must be wrong because we knew there were people working the political process to get a, a, a different decision. Now, there are people working the political process to get the decision that was made. Uh, but the fact that people work in the political process doesn't mean that that, may, that affected the decision. That is the key issue. Uh, let me just get you for the record, Mr. Babbitt. After reviewing the testimony we just saw on the videotape, and I know you reviewed it when you looked at the record, do you have any reason whatsoever to dispute the sworn testimony of these interior officials? I have no reason to dispute their testimony. I believe uh, that the decision uh, was made on the merits in the right fashion and for the right reasons. Now let's explore the theory that's being pursued in this investigation, that the White House influenced the department's decision in the Hudson Casino matter. Did anyone in the White House ever contact you personally about the Hudson Casino application? I've never had a contact or discussion with anyone in the White House. You never I, talked with the Vice President or anyone on his staff about the Hudson Casino issue, did you? I did not. You never talked to Harold Ickes about the Hudson application? I have not. Did you ever have any direct contact with anyone in Mr. Ickey's office about the Hudson Casino matter? I have not. We've seen two documents and heard testimony describing routine status inquiries from two of Mr. Ickey's junior assistants to Heather Sibison, who worked in your, in, in your office for John Duffy. This, did Ms. Sibison ever inform you of these inquiries? Um, I was not informed of those inquiries, I believe, for uh, the right reason. They were utterly routine inquiries. The White House is avalanched with letters and requests from all kinds of people. Now, the members of this committee and this Congress are among the most prolific letter writers. Uh, and, and there's the a White reason House. for it, because we're avalanched by people who are working the political process, some of whom gave us con contributions. Some and members hope will give a contribution. They want to know what the status of things are. The White House has to have some way to, to answer this avalanche, and the way they do it is by making staff-level inquiries. And it seems to me the record's quite clear about that. Staff-level inquiry means they ask what the status is of the case. Yes. In this case, I think uh, a staff assistant and a, and a college intern, or a college student intern. Did Mr. Duffy or anyone else inform you about these inquiries? They did not. Ms. Sibison did not. Did anyone at all at the department inform you that Mr. Ickes or Mr. Ickes' office had a view on the substance or timing of this Hudson decision? No, they did not. And did anyone at all at the department inform you that anyone else in the White House had a view on the substance or timing of the Hudson decision? No, I have no <laughs> recollection of any kind of contact from the White House at all, none. Okay. Now, the chairman said uh, we didn't need to take Mr. Ickey's deposition. It would have been redundant. That wasn't the reason why we had redundant depositions of everybody else involved in this case. But what he hasn't said is what Mr. Ickey said in his deposition. And what Mr. Ickey said in his deposition not given to us, but given to another committee, is that he had no information about this. He did not do anything about it. So we have Mr. Ickes under oath 
saying he didn't make the contact from the White House, and we have you and all the people in the Interior Department saying they never got this contact. There's a gap between those who were supposed to be influencing you. They didn't say they say didn't do it, and you who were supposed to be influenced said you didn't get the message. Now, um, Fred Havenick came here the other day and on our first day of hearings, and he reported a conversation he had with Terry McAuliffe. And according to Mr. Havenick, Mr. McAuliffe took credit for killing the casino deal, thinking apparently that Mr. Havenick wanted the casino killed, even though Mr. Havenick wanted the casino approved. And Mr. Hav uh, Mr. McAuliffe uh, denies that this a conversation ever occurred. Did uh, Terry McAuliffe ever contact you about the Hudson application? I have never spoken with Terry McAuliffe. I think I may have met him across the years. I'm not sure I'd recognize him if he walked into the room. In any event, I've never discussed this issue uh, with Terry McAuliffe. Are you aware of Mr. McAuliffe or anyone working for Mr. McAuliffe contacting anyone in the Department of the Interior on this issue? Uh, I am not. Now, some have suggested that the Interior uh, Department's decision was influenced by contacts by the Democratic National Committee or outside lobbies. We've already explored the White House. Now we're looking at the Democratic National Committee and lobbyists. Did Don Fowler or anyone else at the DNC speak with you about the Hudson application? I have never had a communication from the Democratic National Committee about this matter. Has anyone at the Department of the Interior told you of any contacts by Mr. Fowler or others at the DNC on the Hudson matter? Uh, they have not. And did you have any knowledge at the time of the decision that Indian tribes opposed to the casino had made campaign contributions or would make future campaign contributions? I did not. We have seen some evidence that lobbyists opposed to the casino made partisan political arguments to Mr. Fowler and to others. Uh, were you aware of any of those arguments prior to July 14, 1995, the day of the decision? These issues were all, you know, I have subsequently learned being uh, worked outside the department. The fact is that I had no knowledge of that process. Did you uh, meet with any lobbyists opposed to the casino, opposed to the casino project? I did not. Uh, in fact, the only uh, lobbyist you met with on this issue was Paul Eckstein, who represented Fred Havenick and Galaxy Gaming. Isn't that correct? That's correct. Okay. <coughs> uh, and that is what has apparently led me to have this quality time with the, with well, the committee. Mr. Eckstein is an old friend of yours an associate of yours in politics and business. He was hired by Mr. Havenick to try to get you to go along with Mr. Havenick's desire to have this casino approved. Now, when Mr. Eckstein came in to see you, you knew the decision was going to be against his client. That's you. correct, yes. Now, I suppose when a friend comes in to ask you to go his client's way, you had two choices. You can say to him, sorry, pal, I don't agree with you on the merits, and I'm going to go, we're going to go against you. Or you can do what a lot of, like a lot of people do, say, well, it's going against you, but it's not my fault. It's not a stand-up kind of thing to do, and it's probably a little embarrassing for you. Not, it's not criminal. It's, it seems to me you chose that, chose that latter course. Is that what happened? It's... It, it, you know, I regret it, obviously. I could have said uh, the answer is no, I am not going to intervene in this process. That's the end of it. It's, uh, you know, in, in retrospect, obviously, you know, I could have extended the time. I could have intervened in this process and extended the time. Uh, I had the authority to do it. Uh, what I was doing was making an excuse for something that seemed I suppose from some perspectives, a fairly, you know, <coughs> innocuous request, extend the time. I was not prepared to do that, and uh, I made an excuse. It's a, a human thing to do. Uh, we have, on the record of these hearings, lobbyists who try to take credit for things they didn't do. You were trying to divert blame for something your department was doing. Uh, it's. Uh, it's done all the time. 
Uh, I guess it's called a white lie. It's an excuse. Let me ask you about Tom Collier, your former chief of staff, and John Duffy, your former counselor. They testified yesterday that they never had any substantive discussions with you on the Hudson matter. Michael Anderson, the deputy assistant secretary who made the final decision, and George Skabeen, the career civil servant who recommended denial of the application, also testified that they never discussed the Hudson Casino matter with you. That was their testimony. Is their testimony correct? I believe that's correct. And, and, and let me just uh, uh, add a postscript to that. <clears throat> the, this decision had been delegated. And uh, my policy uh, in a, you know, a decision-making context like this is to let the decision-makers do it. And if there is a substantial divergence within the staff, the chances are it may uh, bubble back up if there's a policy decision which the staff cannot resolve. The reason that I was never drawn into a discussion of this case is because that never happened. There was virtual unanimity among the staff. There wasn't any reason for this uh, to come to my attention. So the people who were on the staff and looking at the issue uh, were clear in their determination on the merits to, to deny the casino uh, what they wanted. I'm, I'm sure from time to time I, you know, had a casual uh, report that this matter was progressing. Uh, I was uh, probably uh, uh, given some information when I uh, went to the listening conference in April, but uh, there wasn't any need to get into the specific issues. One My concern was the policy issues, yeah. and they were in agreement as to how that policy was to be applied in this case. Hilda Manuel uh, worked for you in the department. She wasn't allowed to testify in a public hearing, but she gave her deposition. And it was clear why she wasn't allowed to testify at a public hearing, because in her deposition, she said she talked to you. And you said to her, I don't want to get involved in this. Let the people at the career level and all the others that work for me reach a, a conclusion on this, I'm not going to get involved. Do you recall telling her that? I do not recall that discussion, but I certainly accept it. <laughs> okay. Um, just so, let me ask some more questions. Have you got to just pin this stuff down, get it on the record? Just so we get a clear sense of your knowledge of the decision-making process, do you remember attending an April 1995 Wisconsin Tribal Dialogue in which the Hudson decision came up? I, I'm certain I was there. I don't have a lot of recollection of the actual meeting. I think it was on a day which I was headed up to the Menominee Reservation that afternoon. But at any rate, yes, I, uh, I was there at that meeting in Wisconsin. It was a tribal listening conference. Yes. And, and you made some general remarks uh, at the dialogue, is that right? Um, yes, although my, my knowledge of those remarks is exclusively a result of having seen that transcript. At the time of the meeting, uh, did you have a detailed knowledge of the Hudson application? I, I did not. I may have been, uh, uh, you know, sort of uh, informed that there was an application in the process, that it was controversial, that it involved uh, off-reservation gaming and that was, uh, I, I'm inferring that. I think, I think that's a logical inf inference that I went there uh, with that kind of level of knowledge. Would it be correct to say that you had no substantive involvement in this whole Hudson decision? Uh, I, I had no substantive involvement in this decision at all. And who made the final decision? Final decision was made by Michael Anderson. And did you tell Mr. Anderson how we should decide the application? I don't believe I ever discussed this issue at all with Michael Anderson. Did you give Mr. Anderson any such instructions through John Duffy, Heather Sibison, or anyone else in the Department of the Interior? No, I did not. And did you suggest or even intimate to anyone at the Interior Department that the Hudson application should be denied? I did not. Well, I, I've asked every, every which way. I've tried to take every possibility. And, and make sure we've got this on the record. 
We have no evidence that the White House contacted you. We have clear statements that the, that the people who presumably might have didn't. We have statements from you that you weren't contacted. We have statements from everybody involved in the decision. They made the decision on the merits without political interference. And so what we have here on this fourth day of hearings is more innuendo. Innuendo that maybe there must have been something wrong because political contributions were made by the people who got their way and that they even had a lobbyist. Of course, the other side made contributions and had a lobbyist. Uh, it's a strange coincidence that uh, some of the people involved in the decision went to work for a law firm and represented some of the same uh, tribes that were against this particular matter. But that, uh, referring to Mr. Collier and Mr. Duffy, but they testified yesterday that they went to work for this law firm. There's nothing wrong with it. They checked it out through the ethics uh, process. Maybe we ought to tighten up the laws in this regard. The revolving door, you've indicated to us, even Secretary Lujan went through that revolving door. People go through the revolving door in this town. Uh, we, we would like to see it otherwise. On the other hand, some of the people who go through the revolving door represent uh, uh, clients because they know about the issues that they spent their career uh, working on in government. But that doesn't mean there was anything wrong, anything, certainly anything criminally wrong. Might have been something wrong, but not criminally wrong. So what we have are innuendo. When you have the facts, the facts don't substi substantiate the innuendo. I, I don't know how much time I have left. I have uh, eight minutes, and so I want to uh, yield to Mr. Kanjorski uh, some time. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Waxman. Uh, I just want to reiterate, they, they didn't go to work for this law firm, Mr. Waxman. They went back to work for this law firm. Both in, individuals testified that they came from this law firm. So it's not unusual to work for a prestigious law firm and come to Washington and serve and then return to that law firm. Uh, Mr. Secretary, you, you do entertain, and up until this moment, uh, you have always entertained in this city a solid reputation for professional integrity, veracity, and independence and uh, it is unfortunate that so often uh, some of us are able to construct incredible conspiracies that do raise questions even in the uh, simplest of minds that maybe there is some smoke there and if there is maybe there is some fire there and calls upon individuals like yourself to uh, come before congressional committees or even worse before the media and have to prove a negative. And uh, I have some sympathy for that. But while we were sitting here listening to this conversation of when this happened and what happened, and, and uh, I, I was thinking back that on occasions, I have had the uh, occasion to spend time with you, and I would just love to show how little you remember of the conversations we had. And that I think I could prove to the American people that so many of us in public life uh, get to meet uh, innumerable people in any one day and literally thousands and thousands of people in any one year have what appear to them to be very substantive conversation, which they may recall in almost totality when we are called upon either to refresh our minds or to make mental notes of what happened, have little or no recall. And that for the purposes of protecting ourselves, very often we have people with us that keep daily journals or notes just so that we can refresh something that may have happened a week ago, a month ago, a year ago, but uh, when it gets beyond that point, it, it gets awfully foggy even for the note takers. Uh, the only reason I believe that anyone could raise a question of what should be responded to here is, is this problem of your law partner, uh, former law partner, former law school mate who is a lobbyist, who I think, and I'm, I'm going to give my opinion, I think he took advantage, uh, unusual advantage of a friendship. Uh, but that is not to say that all of us have not had friends that have taken advantage of a friendship when we're in public life. Uh, I, and I think there's no one on this committee that hasn't been called upon to have a meeting or had someone bring up at a meeting a decision or a position you were going to take that you felt it was none of their business and in fact perhaps raised the level of being a conflict that they even brought it up. 
And we've been faced with that problem of how you extricate yourself from that position. It, it, whether or not you remember the total conversation with Mr. Eckstein or not, I can understand that. I hope the American people can. As I understand it, it happened more than two years ago. Uh, it was an extraordinary thing because you, up until that point you had not been involved at all, but here was a man insistent on the very last day to get the last grip to get in to see his old friend that he had served as a fundraiser for and a campaign manager over 24 years. So you saw him and then he, he raised this question, but you sat there uh, and wanted to figure out a way uh, to respond to him without insulting him, uh, without embarrassing him, and yet on the, end, uh, on the other hand, as I understand your testimony today, by not even taking the slightest change that you could have, you could have certainly said, oh, I'll delay it for a week, meaning nothing. And that would have satisfied a friend and perhaps saved you some embarrassment. But you chose uh, the methodology that we all choose at one time or another. And any of us that say we don't tell little white lies, if that's what they're called, or exaggerated excuses, or putting up the name of someone else to take the fall for us, then we're just, a, we're just not being correct. I know that if I can't get something done, it's, it's either the president's fault or the cabinet officer's fault or the majority's fault or something, but we'll certainly, as politicians, uh, we find it very difficult uh, to admit that fault ourselves. I, uh, putting all things aside, when you met with Mr. Eckstein, were you comfortable or uncomfortable? Well, uh, it was an uncomfortable situation. I, <clears throat> in the exercise of of good judgment, <clears throat> I should have declined. First of all, I should have declined the meeting. And, you know, it was the first time in the course of this whole thing that I had met with any advocate or lobbyist of any kind. First time. The decision had actually, it had been made. I don't know whether it had been signed, but the decision had been made. This was a post-decision meeting. Uh, and, uh, you know, attempting to he was attempting to uh, effectively uh, get it stretched out. And uh, that's, you know, obviously a, an uncomfortable situation. It's not to justify the way I handled it. It was a mistake. The majority, in order to uh, ha show some something in their conspiracy theory, showed a lot of memorandum here and other things. One being, one goes back to May. Uh, uh, that the staff for Mr. Ecke, Ick, Ick, Harold Ickey, they prepared for his purposes, indicating that the decision process was made. If anybody paid close attention to the testimony over the last four days, I think they would have realized that once the process was sent from the region to the national level, almost everybody on the national, everybody did agree on the national level that this was not going to be approved and it stretched over a period of three or four months. And I don't think it was a secret that it wasn't going to be approved. It was only then whether Section 20 or Section 465 were going to be used for the reasons of uh, denying the application. And that, in fact, uh, the writer of the decision, Saturn, said that he wrote the decision sometime in early June, even though it wasn't published until July, almost a month later, and he then went on vacation and only uh, came back several weeks after vacation to have the final cleanup. Obviously, if the decision was drafted in early June, it would not have been surprising that people would know in, in late May uh, what, what the uh, uh, ultimate decision would be or where the thrust of the decision, since there was no disagreement. Uh, at any of that period of time, you could have changed that thing. You could have interposed yourself with your staff or those decision makers or talk to the White House or talk to anyone else, and yet you didn't. Your testimony today is absolutely in no way did you have direct or indirect input on the decision made on this application. And That's it was correct. handled in a professional method by your staff. Is that correct? That's correct. Thank you very much, Mr. Secretary. How much time is there, Mr. Chairman? I'll, I'll yield you the balance of our time, about, whatever it is, about and then you'll be next. A little over a minute, Mr. Wise. Okay. Thank you. And you'll be next up. Uh, thank you. Um, 
Mr. Secretary, uh, uh, I'm kind of caught by something. Were you aware, or have you been aware after the fact, that the local opposition was intense, including, I believe, the governor of the state of Wisconsin? Um, <clears throat> I was aware <clears throat> of that after the fact. Uh, now, uh, let me just say for uh, a clarity that in reviewing the file, there is a newspaper clip from, uh, and it's in the record, from my uh, visit to Wisconsin in the spring, in the fall of 1994, in which I was asked about the role of the governor in response. Now, apart from that, uh, I uh, had uh, no reason to uh, discuss the governor or be involved or know of his decision. The letters I have seen suggest that uh, uh, the majority leader of the Wisconsin State Senate, who happens to be a member, as I understand, of the Republican Party, uh, both sides of the aisle, Republican and Democratic members of the House of Representatives, a congressional delegation, including Representative Gunderson, who represents, uh, represented that district at the time, uh, opposed it. And I see my time's getting short, so let me just read an excerpt, and then I'll wait till it rolls back around to me again. In a letter from uh, Representative, Representative Gunder, Gunderson, he was out of office then, but in a letter to Senator Glenn, uh, as hearings were being held over there, uh, Representative Gunderson notes, I sent a letter to the Secretary shortly thereafter stating my opposition. As I recall, the letter indicated that the decision to take the dog truck track into trust would be severely, quote, detrimental to the community and thus ill-advised. It is important for the committee, the Senate committee, to understand the depth of feeling in opposition to the casino at that time. It is also my impression that the opposition would be greater today. The only merit in expanding the reservation for casino purposes was to try and salvage something for the huge investment in the dog track facility. That was a letter from the Republican, then, uh, it, uh, from the Republican representative who represented that district uh, concerning this matter. So I will return to that when my time comes back. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wise. Uh, Mr. Horn, you're recognized for 10 minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Secretary, I, I believe you feel that the senior civil servant was the one that made this decision, Mr. Skabine, and uh, that was not a political appointee, I believe. Uh, uh, <clears throat> am I correct in that? Congressman, no, I, I, I don't think that's uh, uh, correct. The decision letter and the decision itself was made uh, by Michael Anderson. Right. Who uh, but the record agree, shows, I think. Yeah, we all agree he is quite, a political appointee. Quite clearly. But uh, I'm bringing up Mr. Skabine because we did depose him, and uh, he is, I think, a member of the solicitor's office now as a sin civil servant. Uh, I, I want to refer to Exhibit 363. There's eight letters there that testify uh, under oath that uh, Mr. Skabine, when he came to uh, explain the decision, uh, said the following. And uh, he said, uh, quote, that staff had approved the application, but when it went up to the secretary's office, politics took over, period, unquote. And you will find that repeated in various things, but basically that's it, 363, 363, 1 through a 7. Now, I want to move, uh, I, I guess I'd say, is Mr. Skabine right on that, that politics did take over? Um, Congressman, I, I watched the exchange uh, in this committee when Mr. Skabine was asked about this, and I must say, I don't think any fair-minded person could doubt the veracity of his answer. Now, uh, there were affidavits uh, submitted uh, from a number of other uh, participants at that meeting, uh, uh, clearly substantiating Mr. Skabeen's testimony, and I, uh, I watched that uh, uh, quite carefully. Well, I, thank, I, I just don't. Uh, thank you. Uh, there are eight any here that, that say he said that, and they say it word for word. Let me move to another exhibit, three fourteen. And I'm looking primarily at 314, 3, and 4. Now, this uh, four-page exhibit is written by Mr. Scott Dacey, who's the lobbyist for the Wisconsin Green Bay Casino of the Oneida tribe, and who 
is working in opposition to turning over to the poor Wisconsin tribes the Hudson uh, Dog Track Casino. Now, he describes meetings of May 23rd and May 24th. At the end, he says Mike Anderson, who we all agree was the political appointee that made the decision, uh, said to me after our meeting, that this is at the bottom of the page, that they are trying to keep this issue on the merits and they will, quote, try to thread the needle, unquote, on this request. Uh, would you agree that uh, this is what uh, what they were doing and agree with Mr. Ant Anderson's comment? Mr. Uh, uh, Congressman, I've, I've not had Bottom a of the page, bottom of page three. Mike Anderson said to me, this is again Dacey, the lobbyist for the Wisconsin tribe that didn't want any competition either, just like the Minnesota tribe. Well, I can't waste my time, and uh, I guess I'll withdraw the question of you. But here we have Anderson saying that, and if we turn to page four, Dacey, based on his conversation with Anderson, says to his client, of, uh, which is Debbie Doxeter, chairwoman of the Oneida Business Committee, he says, things might change when the politicians like Babbitt and Duffy become involved, but without the law on their side, it will be difficult to kill the deal. In other words, Anderson sort of implied that the law was on their side. Should Babbitt come out against Hudson, he will likely find his excuse in Section 151 of the Code of Federal Regulations. I would strongly suggest we look into this area of the law to help Babbitt reach his decision. Now, are you aware of any contacts by Mr. Dacey or representatives of the Oneida tribe on this subject? No, I am not. And, and looking at this, it, it looks to me like another one of these sunrise deals. Okay. A lobbyist basically, well, I, you know, uh, saying yes, it's going to be impossible it, to make the sun rise. Right. But uh, when it does, right. uh, I will have done it. Okay. Let's uh, then move down the line here uh, to uh, uh, the memo from one of Harold Ickey's staffers to another of Harold Ickey's staff. It's been referred to a few times. It's uh, 317 is the memo. And uh, just take a look at that. And uh, some would say it's a status report. Others would say, obviously, there had to be a lot of talking somewhere to get that status report. And I just wondered uh, what you think of that. Uh, Heather Sibison, who uh, you did not invite to testify, uh, in her deposition, I believe the deposition was given to the Thompson Committee. Over here, here's one. Uh, discussed this uh, in some detail, I think quite convincingly, and rather than attempt to uh, recapitulate her discussion of this, I would simply say I read her statements in the record, and I think they're very persuasive. I uh, worked in my past incarnation as a uh, assistant to a cabinet secretary, and uh, I'm curious whether your people talk to you or you talk to your people, because I listened in and sat in on some of these uh, various depositions, and they all had a sort of I can't recollect disease, which is very widely in this town due to the water or something. And uh, I was just curious, Don't, didn't they ever stick their heads in and say, Chief, we got a hot one coming up here. What are we going to do about it? Well, Congressman, uh, I preside over a department with 65,000 employees. Well, you're saying, did they or didn't they come into your office? Eight to ten what I'm after. agencies. About and this there's nothing unusual about these specific adjudicatory matters being handled entirely outside of my purview. Now, that has been the case with these. Now, well, here's I'm what certain they, that yeah. Here, here's what they said on a casual basis. Uh, I, it, I, I'd like to finish if I may. Okay, but I, it, I know we filibuster on some of these knowing we have limited time, but let me just read so you, we make sure you're responding to this. Is a byproduct what they say in this memo? as uh, Harold Ickey's staffers, who's checked, obviously, with your department and your office, 
is a byproduct of the wealthier tribes lobbying against the application. And then the fact is, this important, this memo is, which was drafted nearly six weeks before the rejection of the application, also said they will probably decline without offering much of an explanation. That was referring to what the decision would be in the department. So this wasn't news to the White House. That they got it from somewhere, and I would think usually they pick up the phone and call the secretary or the secretary's top assistant. But we can't get anybody to keep telling us why oh, we know nothing on, about come it. Come on, come on, no way, no way. The avalanche of stuff that comes into the White House where people need information to respond and otherwise is always handled at a routine level. People okay. don't call me up uh, from the White House or anywhere else. To de I mean, come on. There, there, yeah. there are, I have things to do during the day, with all due respect. Right. And it ain't this. Okay. Heather Sibison is assistant to Duffy. Duffy is your counselor. Uh, the way staff respond to these is they say, what's the boss think about this? And either they stick their head in or you let them know oh, where you uh, are. Congressman, I... That just isn't the way you run an agency of 65,000 employees on a matter like this. I would have a line a half mile long outside my office all day long. When it's a White the House. The bottom line, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, when that, it's that, a White House call, I think usually the secretary's informed. Oh, you've got to be assistant. kidding. you got to be kidding. Really? Mr. Horn, would you yield just for a moment? Yeah. Uh, let me oh, just... I, I'm sorry, I won't yield. I want to finish it, and you're welcome on your time to uh, do something. Okay, let me move into another uh, area here. Uh, turning to the very important question of opposition from the community, you've testified this was very important, and you've also been very public with your statements that your department will not force off-reservation casinos on unwilling communities, and we know about the Wisconsin bipartisan political opposition. But I guess I'm curious, uh, you've emphasized the importance of the opposition, and did that really make the difference in this decision, that this community opposition, did that make the difference? Or were there other factors? The, the decision itself, signed by Michael Anderson, it seems to me is a pretty good starting point for this. Okay. Now, let me ask you, if that's a good starting point, if more citizens supported the Hudson Casino than opposed it, would it be a significant factor? Well, le let me give you my view of this opposition issue and uh, suggest that there are, uh, you know, there are differing shades of kind of, uh, of these are all relatively new issues, and there's not a lot of settled case law. You want my opinion? I think the important thing in assessing local opposition is not to count names on petitions, although that certainly is some evidence. Well, it's, I believe, it's my time. If, if I may, I finish? You know, I'll, I would like to my finish time. if I may. I want to get this well, point in before uh, Congressman, we... Congressman, If somebody wants Mr. to give Chairman, me what I thought I would Mr. Like Chairman to finish was another this question, five minutes. If I may. I think the gentleman fair. from California has the time. I think he just wants to finish with one more question. If he could, Mr. We'll, Chairman, I'm, we'll be our happy. side has no objection to letting uh, a, a time be extended so that a witness can properly answer a question. And we will grant the, we will grant the witness a time to answer. Yeah. I have not declined one time letting him answer. He will be able to answer yeah. the question fully. Mr. Horn. I have in my hand the petition signed by about uh, over a thousand people, which wasn't found in the record till fairly recently, which isn't in the what was provided the court by Interior in their 14 volume record quote of all the significant decision making material for this matter. And I just wonder how this petition, which supports the casino, just doesn't happen to be in the record that's filed with the federal court. And that bothers me, and that's why I was curious how much we care about people that were supportive of the casino. So I just wonder if you're aware of this with 1,413 signatures. This is the petition. And uh, we found, you know, as was mentioned earlier by the chairman, boxes mysteriously come up here after people have either been deposed. Congressman, I, I take exception to that. I, uh, I, I really do. We have made 
an enormous and extensive uh, effort to respond. And I think that any, uh, I, I just think that's an unwarranted uh, characterization. I really do. The, the, the gentleman's time has expired. Mr. Babbitt, Secretary Babbitt, you have the opportunity to respond to the question. Mr. Chairman, there. thank you. Yeah. Uh, I hope you'll address the one issue he raised there at the end about the uh, signatures on that petition not being included in, the, in your record. Well, um, I, Mr. Chairman, I, I'd have to respond to that in writing, obviously. Uh, I don't have any independent facts, but I'd well, be happy well, to. Why would you have to respond to that in writing? You have counsel with you, who, and you have staff people who have that. It's, it's well documented. Because I have no idea what the document is, where it came from, uh, who sent it, uh, where it was filed. I, 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 I don't want to belabor this point, but this is 1,400 and some people who signed this petition and it was not included in the record. It was extremely important because we're talking about opposing views on this. Mr. Mr. So it's Chairman. A, it's a significant part of the discussion, so would you please uh, try to refer to it and answer Mr. Chairman, that? parliamentary inquiry. I'd be happy to answer your parliamentary inquiry. Do we have copies of that for, for us? I the gentleman intending to introduce out. that as an exhibit? I think we had those passed out yesterday, but if not, we'll get them for you right now. Thank Mr. you. Mr. Chairman. Have copies of the petition for every member. Uh, there's nothing on the, on the face of a document that indicates that it ever came to the Interior Department. Maybe it did, maybe it didn't. Uh, I'd be happy to respond, but I can't tell you anything from just looking at the document. But the petition was not included in the record. We'll, we'll, we'll check and see if it was forwarded to the Department. If it wasn't, we'd like to have an answer in writing for I, you. I, I, I'd on be, why it was not included in the record. I'd, I'd be happy to do that. You want to answer the rest of the question, Secretary? Yes. The, the issue of how you judge community opposition, I think, is an important issue. And here is my view. I believe that the only realistic way to do this is to refer to local elected officials. I don't think the law uh, contemplates that we should carry out a poll or, you know, do this by saying, well, uh, petitions against have 10 more signatures than petitions for. I think the clear intent of this statute is that we should give great deference to the views of the local governments and the local officials that are chosen in communities to deal with these kinds of issues. Now, in this case, there were three of those communities. One was Hudson, where uh, the site was located. The city council, in my judgment, is the place to look for a community opinion. They passed a resolution in opposition. The second place to look is the town of Troy. Troy is adjacent. It surrounds the track on three sides. We looked at the town council of Troy. They were unanimously opposed. The third community <coughs> within the checklist used by the Bureau of Indian Affairs was the San Croix tribe, St. Croix tribe. They, too, had registered their official opposition. Now, that, to me, is the proper and, and, and appropriate approach. Now, there are many others, the Wisconsin Attorney General, Congressmen, uh, uh, legislators, uh, uh, their views are all entitled to wait, as are uh, the, the signers of petitions. But in my judgment, uh, the local governments are uh, the place to begin this analysis. And they were all against it. My time is up. I'll continue it when time comes again. Mr. Konjarski, you're recognized for 10 minutes. Right, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, we're going to pass over seniority here to Mr. Barrett, who's been so conscientious and studious and is from Wisconsin so that he can have the first five minutes, Mr. Barrett. Thank you, Mr. Kinjarski. First of all, Mr. Babbitt, thank you for being here. I think that you made the correct decision. I think you made the decision for the correct reasons. I think it is important to look at local opposition. And this was an issue for me because there are four other dog tracks in the state of Wisconsin. And I, I foresaw the uh, scenario of each of those dog tracks then becoming a target um, for for gaming, and that is something that people of the state of Wisconsin did not want, whether it 
was Indian gaming or non-Indian gaming, there was a constitutional amendment that addressed this issue specifically. There were ballot questions within the state that issued this, that addressed this issue specifically. So I think you, you did make the right decision. Let me ask you a question, though, about your meeting with Mr. Eckstein. Um, you've sat before this committee. You've referred to it as quality time with us. We appreciate having you here. You had the opportunity for quality time in the Senate as well. Let's say that you had granted Mr. Eckstein's request. Where do you think you'd be sitting right now? <laughs> well, I'd be sitting here. Uh, in, look, if I had granted his request, uh, the allegation would have been that having stayed out of the process, uh, for uh, the entire course of this, all of a sudden, a lobbyist, a lawyer lobbyist hired by a casino company uh, trying to change the result by invoking a personal friendship succeeds. And uh, I wasn't prepared to do that. And, uh, and I, I think, think you would be sitting here today. Uh, so maybe in retrospect, you could have just marked this day off. That this was the day that you would be sitting before this committee, regardless of what decision you made. This is the book with the documents. This is the smoking guns. This is the timesheets, the depositions, the memos. Did you make this decision based on political consideration, or was this decision Congressman, made? Congressman, the answer, uh, the answer is no. And let me just say that I think a fair-minded person looking at the record of this, would say, you know, the folks at the Department of the Interior really did an outstanding job of managing this issue and making the decision. The process really works. There were all kinds of people floating around on both sides. I mean, you know, this Rich Trump, Poor Trump stuff in this. These Florida gaming guys are as big and determined and scuzzy as the guys on the other side. And they were all swarming all over this process. And the fact is that our people at the Interior Department kept a quiet zone free of all of this in which the decision was made. I'd like to ask you another question, Mr. Secretary, and this is a question um, that deals with the practices within the department and deals with our, our action as Congress. As you indicated, your predecessor, uh, Mr. Lujan, had been back to lobby your department. We know that Mr. Collier and Mr. Duffy have done so. Um, when I heard that, I thought, this is not right. I was told uh, that that provision was put in the law to allow uh, Indians to have access or tribes to have access to people with expertise. Um, the issue was raised or objected to the representation by three Indian tribes. Do you think it's time for us to revisit that issue? I, uh, the, the answer is yes. I think it could be revisited. I don't think that revisiting uh, necessarily yields an automatic predetermined answer for this reason. Um, there are a fair number of Indian tribes who now have the resources to hire counsel, um, and that certainly includes most of the gaming tribes. Uh, and this provision surely is not necessary uh, uh, in that context. The other 95 percent of the Indian tribes in this country are just as nearly as poor as they were in 1975. And there are places, uh, small tribes, uh, which will have a tough time paying lawyers and getting counsel to get up the learning curve. There are a lot of places where uh, Indian law is an arcane specialty. And I think that some of the conditions which prompted this law still apply. But it, clearly, there are a number of areas where it doesn't. I would like to work with you and with the chairman of the committee to do that. And I think that my time has expired. I will yield back to Mr. Kenjorski. Thank you. And again, thank you, Mr. Secretary. Now represent or recognize Mr. Wise. Mr. Secretary, I want to continue where we left off, and that was about the local uh, opposition, and particularly that of elected officials who represent their constituencies. Uh, the majority leader, I've seen a letter, I don't know whether you have, uh, the, where the majority leader of the Wisconsin State Senate had written a letter in opposition to this, uh, uh, this project moving forward. Uh, the, I, I mentioned at the time that the then elected representatives in the House delegation included uh, Representative Toby Roth, Representative Steve Gunderson, who represented the district where it would have been located 
both stating their opposition, and I believe other members of the delegation, Democrats, did as well. There's a letter that I've seen uh, where uh, State Representative Sheila Harsdorf, herself a Republican, had gotten a petition signed by 29 other elected state legislators, Senate and House members, Republican and Democrat, opposing this. Uh, the fact of the matter is that there was extensive opposition by the elected leadership is that not of the state of Wisconsin. Is that not true? Uh, that's absolutely clear. In fact, I'm kind of struck uh, the governor of Wisconsin is Republican, the majority leader is Republican, uh, the House members at the time who opposed it were Republican, Representative Hor State Representative Horstor is Republican. I kind of wonder, you might be here as a tool of the Republican Party uh, uh, by the way that you ruled. Maybe that's what this investigation ought to be about. Let me ask you um, uh, this as well. You have uh, uh, stated that you had no contact with Mr. Ickes on this matter. Is that correct? That's correct. And Mr. Ickes, as I understand it, uh, in a deposition in the Senate, has stated that he had no contact with you. Uh, my question to you is, would you be just as happy to have Mr. Ickes testify here today? Sure. And would you feel perfectly confident in having him testify in front of this committee? Sure. To confirm what you have said? Absolutely. And I guess my question then is, why isn't Mr. Ickes here today, and why hasn't he been called, and why hasn't he been deposed by this committee? And I think the reason is that Mr. Ickes will confirm what he said in the Senate, and what you have said all along is that there's been no contact between them. There's a problem in this investigation that the uh, majority has taken forth. There's a big gap uh, right here between, uh, and, and, and they can't establish that there's been any contact because there hasn't been. Now, um, I want to also echo something Mr. Uh, Barrett brought up, because I'm struck by this. Element number one is there is intense local opposition, certainly stated, uh, if you go through all the, the exhibits uh, by elected officials in the state of Wisconsin, including the representatives, state representatives and senators and, and House members to the, the federal delegation, the majority leader of the state senate and so on. Intense local opposition to this project, number one. Number two is your friend, uh, former associate, Mr. Eckstein, when he came in, came in representing the opposite point of view from what you ruled, didn't you? That's correct. He was the only, is it your testimony that he was the only advocate on either side that got in your door? That's correct. And, you, and your agency or your department then ended up ruling counter to what he wanted. Is that correct? Well, I don't, I have yet, yet, I don't think there is a single member of this committee that I have heard during this entire course of hearings say that they disagreed with the department's decision. Not heard one member of this committee say that. And so I guess what I'm, and then and fi <clears throat> finally, you have said that there was no contact with Mr. Ickes in the White House. Mr. Ickes has said in deposition that there was no contact with you. I'm, I'm just kind of struck, what are we doing here? And had, and had you ruled the opposite way in the face of intense opposition from the State House on down in Wisconsin, basically Republican, uh, much of it Republican dominated, had you ruled the opposite way when your friend and former associate, the only advocate to get in, wanted you to rule the opposite way, we'd be here today, as Mr. Baird said, conducting the same hearing, but it'd be reversed. It'd be, why did you give in to Mr. Eckstein? Why did you ignore the overwhelming local opposition in Wisconsin? Uh, I just, I'm struck by this, uh, that we're here. Um, uh, Mr. Babbitt, and I regret, uh, regret that uh, we're here under these circumstances and that you're here. But I think it is good that we've had this hearing and we can get this out uh, because I think it is an important matter. Finally, as I close, Ms. Secretary Babbitt, um, you've not testified on this and I'm not asking you to comment. I will say this. Apparently there was money that uh, was contributed to the Democratic Committee from on both sides of this, I suspect there's been significant money contributed to both parties, Republican and Democrat, by the gaming uh, advocates uh, from all over the country. And this is another compelling reason, wherever you fall out, that this Congress ought to be voting this year on campaign finance reform and eliminating soft money. And Mr. Chairman, I'd just like to suggest, as the President suggested on, in the State of the Union message the other night, that the best thing that we could do is to have the Republican and Democratic leaderships agree to bring a bill up on the floor of the House this year, and we can eliminate uh, this kind of situation ever having to come before this committee again. Thank you. Mr. Souter, you're recognized for 10 minutes. 
I wanted to clear up something before I started my uh, questioning, because several times you've referred to conspiracy as have members on the minority side. Do you think I'm part of a conspiracy? Uh, uh, Congressman, I've never met you before. I've never uh, spoken with you. Uh, I, uh, you don't look conspiratorial to me. I want to confess that I do have a staff member who went to Pepperdine Law School. I'm hoping to make one of the charts somewhere along the line. Um, do you think Janet Reno was part of a conspiracy when she wanted to have a preliminary inquiry into this? No. Um, I think that you're concerned when aspersions are cast uh, even indirectly on yourself, and I would appreciate the same concern for us. We have a duty here in this committee because, as the Democratic members have pointed out in the tobacco question, they've pointed out in general campaign finance, there's a deep concern in this country that when people put lots of money into one po uh, party, and when they hire people who were the Democratic National Treasurer, meet with the Democratic National Chairman, meet with people from the reelect committee, when they see memos going, that in fact influence may have been there. I hope, I honestly hope, that you and everybody in the department are completely innocent and will never learn that been mistruths told. But our obligation as elected officials is to pursue this, even if sometimes it comes to badgering, to repeat, and seeming to badger seem to ask these questions numerous times, because that's our obligation as elected officials. And I hope you appreciate that. Um, I wanted to follow up with the um, question on whether applicant tribes uh, are uh, fully informed if their application is flawed. Do you consider an application process to be flawed if indeed the tribes aren't fully consulted in a meaningful way? I, I, I think the law uh, requires a consultation, yes. And uh, you said several times that you met with tribal members or the representatives. And did you ever say yourself that the Department of Interior has identified a, patient, a potentially fatal flaw in their application and you need to do X or Y to correct it? Well, I, I think that if you look at the transcript uh, of my remarks, at the listening conference, uh, uh, there's some pretty clear notice in that. Now, it was not directed to the specifics of this, but it was a, it was a discussion uh, of the issue. And I said very clearly to every, every participant who came to that in the state of Wisconsin that, I, that our policy was not to do these cram downs and that absent support from the local community, uh, we were not in the business of doing that. Now, uh, the difficulty here is this. The difficulty is the gambling company. Because don't you see, they were anchored in a community that didn't want them. And nor, I mean, it was a, what could be done about it? Normally, what would be done about it is that the tribes would do a little forum shopping and look around, and there, there probably are communities that would be happy to have this. But the tribes didn't have that choice because these guys were anchored in a community that didn't want them. The we, opposition was hardening. I mean, we certainly what had, was there to be worked out? We certainly had testimony that, in fact, the community was divided early. It certainly seemed to have consensus late. The only unanimous opposition early was the Minnesota Indian tribes. But I want to get back to my line of questioning. To your knowledge, did anyone uh, in the department specifically say, you need to do this to get your application changed? In other words, um, well, do you need to I, prove this from the town of Hudson, or was part of this that they had to win the approval of the Minnesota tribes, which was impossible? I was not part of the, of the give and take of this process. So the answer to your question is, I. I don't have any recollection of that, and I shouldn't have because I was part of the, not part of the process. Well, you now, if you look at the record that this committee has compiled over the last two weeks, I think there's solid evidence of interaction uh, with these tribes, so you're with the applicants, and that they, they, had, they had adequate notice. Would you yield for a, a moment, problem. Mr. Souter? Oh, wait, can I do? Okay, go ahead. Hey. I would only draw your attention, Mr. Secretary, to the record, to the testimony of Mr. Skabeen. In response to the question, was there communication from your office about specific problems with their application, 
Mr. Skabeen, a dedicated career civil servant, responded, in writing, I don't think there were. And I would like to, um, climbing back my time, have Exhibit 353-2 uh, put up on the screen. And I would like to read that and also from uh, Exhibit 335. Mr. Skabeen was explaining that the July 14 rejection letter constituted a form of notice of the alleged deficiencies in Hudson application. He was representing that the rejection letter was a form of consultation. And one of our committee counsel asked him, question, but prior to the rejection of the application, that is an easy way to do it, to tell the people in advance what the problems are and let them cure it. Answer, yes, we could have done that. That is not the way I did the first application. That is not the way we did it at this point. Earlier in the deposition, he was asked, question, here were three poor Indian tribes that have presented an application to the Department of Interior, and you were making a determination as to whether to approve the application or deny the application. If you, as director of the IGMS staff, identified a particular problem that might lead to the rejection of an application, did you consider it important to communicate that directly to the applicant tribe to give them an opportunity to cure the problem? Answer, good question. I don't think that I did, in, on, did that on this application. The first application I considered as head of the gaming office. If I were to do it again, different now, you know, it might be different. It might be something I would consider doing, but at the time I didn't do it. Now, were you aware that... Uh, Congressman, uh, what you were just reading from is not on 353 353.2 was the first one, the second one is 353.1. 353.1. Do you have any comment on that? Because I think the record shows that Mr. Scabine is saying that there were many things, but it, in this particular case, while there was early consultation, he did not once it went to the Washington, have direct contact on the specifics with the Wisconsin tribe. Uh, I'm sorry, are these both, they're not marked, are they both uh, uh, Mr. Skabeen's deposition? Yes. Uh, no, it's testimony. I'm sorry. Oh, oh. The, earlier, the second one was, yeah, they're both depositions, excuse me. Uh, I'm sorry. Well, let me move. I have one other point while you're looking at that, and this is Exhibit 335. Um, this is an analysis of the Hudson case by the Department of Justice lawyer David Jones. He states, we are primarily concerned about our ability to show that the plaintiffs were told about and given an opportunity to remedy the problems which the department ultimately found were outcome determinative. Area directors are told to give applicants an opportunity to cure problems. It will be hard to argue persuasively that applicants lose this opportunity once the central office begins its review. The administrative record, as far as we can tell, contains no record of department meetings or communications with the applicant tribes in which the department's concerns were expressed to plaintiffs. In other words, when they were talking to the tribes at the local level, the application was moving. But once it moved to Washington, where it does appear fairly unanimity, they stopped talking to the affected tribes. That's a test, the deposition testimony of Mr. Skabeen. It's the concern of the Department of Justice. And have you seen this analysis before? And what's your comments on it? Oh, well, I've not seen the analysis before. And, and I guess, uh, uh, you know, I'm reluctant to characterize a record that's just being sort of thrown up at me. Uh, I, uh, the answer is I'm not prepared uh, to, you know, characterize the record. I would say two things. Uh, there was obviously a fair amount, as I read the record, of verbal communication going back and forth. It's, uh, uh, very important uh, uh, to an assessment of this. Uh, secondly, I can tell you that having read the transcript of my listening conference uh, 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 remarks, uh, I would say there was some pretty good notice right there. The specific thing, as I understand it, is to try to work, particularly with tribes that aren't in the major metropolitan areas in that area, having lived up there, there's only one big city. Duluth already has an Indian casino yeah. in downtown Duluth. Um, there's not a lot of options for the poorer tribes, and they need some flexibility. And partly, I would think that, uh, well, I didn't favor the Indian gaming laws and believe this stuff is being stretched, which is why I said I think made the right decision, even though it was kind of uh, on new grounds, that this debate about how you made the decision becomes important because this type of question comes up if you cite one clause, and it doesn't if you cite another. And that's partly why there was this internal debate as to how the department was going to handle this because the appearance, and that's what we've been trying to establish here, is, is what it looks like, is, is that on the particular grounds of mileage and the Arthur Anderson study, that this would have gone forth. 
But the political opposition, the dog track referendum the first time, actually was supported by the community of Hudson when it was a different tribe, admittedly. It wasn't this particular tribe, but support, a casino was supported. Then there was a change in mayor, change in the community, the local Hudson community changed. What was constant was the Minnesota tribes. Then they realized they were in trouble after the local decision, started pouring money into the Democratic Party nationally. Admittedly, this is appearance. We haven't established this. That's what we've been probing. That, that tremendous lobbying effort, even going up to the president and indirectly to the vice president of the United States to multiple things. And suddenly there's a change even in the rationale. And that's what we're trying to get to the bottom of. And it is important whether they were consulted after it got to Washington. Well, obviously the record uh, uh, speaks for itself on this. I, um, point, of inquiry, uh, point of inquiry, Mr. Chairman. Chairman, the gentleman will state his point. Uh, it sounds as if the record of this listening session, which the secretary has suggested, was an opportunity for the tribes to cure defects in their application is very important. Do we have the transcript from that listening session as part of the documentation or part of the exhibit record here? Let me check with staff. Would you, the, the, the sure. deposition or the, the listening record that he's talking about regarding how the deposition is, but he's talking about the listening record that uh, that was made at, uh, at these meetings with Indian tribes, I presume is what he's talking about. Yes, I believe we supplied that transcript to the committee uh, some have, weeks ago. It's, it's, it's a very thick document, uh, April 8th, 1995. April 8th, 1995. April 8, 1995. Would staff get that for uh, Mr. Sununu and anybody else that would like to have it? And given that it's such a thick document, it would certainly be helpful if the secretary or council could identify specific examples in that record that were attempts to identify defects in the application. Thank you. Yield back. Uh, Mr. Kinjorski. Uh, Mr. Chairman, just for the record, I listened to Mr. Souter's opening remarks. Where he, where he took umbrage with the secretary, that there is a requirement, an obligation on the part of the, of the Congress and the majority to pursue this. Uh, and I agree. But then I reiterate the question Mr. Waxman has made. Why isn't there an obligation to pursue the question of $50 billion, $50 billion in special tax breaks to the largest contributor of the Republican Party, the tobacco industry, and that, that was lobbied and put together by the Speaker of the House of Representatives, the majority leader of the Senate, in the 11th hour in the dark of the evening when no one knew about it, and by the lobbyist efforts of the former chairman of the Republican Party, Haley Bar Barber. Why aren't we investigating that? I think we have an obligation to pursue that too. And now, uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to have Mr. Wise uh, for one minute. Thank you. Um, I just point out, Mr. Secretary, you may not have had time to examine this petition of support that we've all just received, uh, uh, ostensibly 1,400 names or something on it. I find it interesting that we, the undersigned, as residents of the greater Hudson, Wisconsin area, do hereby affirm our support. It goes on to say, um, then you turn to the second page, and the requirement before you sign, you must be a qualified registered voter living within the greater area of Hudson, Wisconsin, or you must have lived within the greater area of Hudson, Wisconsin for the last 10 days. I just turn to the f first page and note with interest, uh, I have to go pretty far down it before I find one person from Wisconsin. Uh, most are from Minnesota, uh, fine state, and I know we're right, ac right across the line, but most are from Minnesota, many from uh, St. Paul. And so I question whether this is a, an outpouring of uh, local uh, support from the citizens of Wisconsin. I just note that uh, for the record. Thank you. Would the, would the gentleman yield for briefly? Yeah, yeah. I, I would, in terms of the petition that you were looking at that we have in front of us, wasn't that alleged that that petition was not, in fact, part of the record? that was considered by the Secretary's office? and it was fact, my understanding it, of the allegation. And in fact, unless I'm, I'm missing something right here that is absolutely part of the record. I'm informed by my staff that this was a part of the 14-volume administrative record, so I believe the Congressman was in error. So in other words, the suggestion that it wasn't part of the record is not correct. That's Maybe fine. on that point, Mr. Chairman, you mean a member of the committee represented that this petition wasn't part of the record, and now it was part of the administrative record? Were you talking, you're referring now to the petition that was, uh, had well, the signatures on it? 1,400 names that were denied, supposedly, from the administrative record 
I, th I think Mr. That Horn suggested in his direct examination that it wasn't part of the administrative record. Now we hear, in fact, it was. I don't think he said the administrative record. I think he was talking about the, to the it hadn't been submitted as part of the record of the federal court. Well, the federal court case, the secretary has nothing involved in that. He only has involvement in having prepared the record, the administrative record of the application pending before the Secretary of Interior, not in the defense of uh, it. Mr. Chairman, it actually was part of the administrative record filed in the federal court. The copy that I was given uh, here does not have the so-called Bates stamp number on it. I am told that the Bates stamp number in the administrative record, you can find it in the administrative record, it two, starts at 24 04. So it was part of the administrative record filed with the federal court. It was also given to this committee. I should also say that there's also other petitions in there from, from the w bearing the signatures of twice as many people as this one uh, uh, going the opposite way. Let, let, let me get some clarification on this. We will not take out of your time. So Appreciate it. check on this but uh, it's the understanding of our council that in the 14 volumes that was submitted to the court it was not in there if that is incorrect we will set the record straight we're going to check on that uh, gentleman uh, Mr. Kondrowski is recognized yes we'll recognize Ms. Maloney for five minutes thank you uh, Mr. Secretary the uh, last time I saw you in New York we were touring an a historic monument Grant's tomb and there were scores of press following you around because the next day they were going to announce who the Democratic nominee was going to be for the Supreme Court. And many people thought that that nominee was going to be you. You remember, Mr. Secretary? Yes, I do. It seems like a long time ago, and I don't think that that is ever coming my way again. <laughs> well, I must say that uh, after sitting here for four days, and reviewing all the documents and, and, and looking at all the memorandum, it appears that you are uh, truly in a no-win situation. Uh, you're sort of damned if you do and damned if you don't. I, I, I hate to think what would have happened if you had ruled in favor of the request of your lobbyist friend, Mr. Eckstein, who wanted you to delay a decision I hate to think what would have happened if you had overruled the, the opinion of practically every um, local community and elected official who was opposed to the project. I, I can imagine what the hearings would have been like then. But as you testified and as Mr. Skabeen testified and as we saw on tape today, instead of listening to your lobbyist friend, uh, you listened to your career staff and based your decision professionally on their research and on their uh, unified decision in opposition. But we'll continue with this hearing on campaign fundraising in just a moment. On Thursday, Independent Counsel Kenneth Starr continued his investigation into allegations involving the President and former White House intern Monica Lewinsky. She spent most of the day with her attorneys inside the Cosmos Club here in Washington, D.C. 